we have a quorum here. So as soon as um, Senator Kikefer and I think Senator Severs Ganser might be joining via Zoom, or um, I'll confirm that. But if you see her show up, we'll mark her present when she gets here. Uh, could you take, Mr. Thorley, could you take the roll? Senator Dennis. Senator Kikefer. Senator Goykachia. Senator Hammond. Here. Senator Raddy. Senator Severs Ganser. Senator Canizaro. Here. Senator Dondero Loop. Here. Chair Brooks. Here. Um, so we can get started. We have a quorum. The first thing we have uh, a couple things we're going to do today. We're going to um, uh, recess this meeting at the end and, and, and come back, possibly come back later in the day. Uh, we're going to introduce the BDR first. Um, then we're going to have uh, a work session. And uh, after I, I introduce the BDR, we, we introduce the BDR, um, staff will uh, give us the list of work session bills that we're going to work session. Then we're going to hear some bills. And then we're going to potentially take uh, work session bills um, based on those hearings. And then uh, we may or may not come back. And so we're just going to have to kind of be a little flexible today as we kind of reach some, some milestone uh, dates on our calendar. Um, we will start with the BDR. Everyone should have the BDR on their desk. It's BDR 551095. Revises provisions relating to certain persons licensed or certified by the Division of Financial Institutions of the Department of Business and Industry or Commissioner of Financial, Financial Institutions. Um, could I get a motion to introduce? Move to introduce. I have a motion from Senator Dennis. Second. Second from Senator Dondero Loop. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. aye. Uh, opposed, nay. And the motion passes unanimously with the members present. And that will bring us to our next item, which is work session. And if uh, Mr. Thorley and Mr. Hartz, if you could um, walk us through which bills we will be work sessioning right now. Um, and uh, then after that, so the members can, can get access to that. And then we'll start with the first one. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Uh, the bills that will be presented to the committee today for work session include Senate Bill 76, Senate Bill 210, Senate Bill 225, I'm sorry, Senate Bill 325, Senate Bill 93, Senate Bill 147, Senate Bill 175, Senate Bill 185, Senate Bill 198, Senate Bill 211, Senate Bill 233, Senate Bill 310, Senate Bill 340, and Senate Bill 389. Again, quickly, these are all Senate bills, 76, 210, 325, 93, 147, 175, 185, 198, 211, 233, 310, 340, 389. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so whenever you are ready, we are Wayne Thorley for the record, LCB Fiscal Analysis Division. Uh, Senate Bill 76 is a committee bill from the Department of Education I'm sorry, as a committee bill from the Committee on Education on behalf of the Department of Education. It was heard in Senate Finance on April 23rd. Uh, it's a large policy bill. Uh, there is one particular section in the bill uh, related to eliminating the requirement uh, in statute for end of course exams. Um, and that elimination of the in, in statute is consistent with the budget decision. Uh, by the, uh, the money committees to eliminate funding in the Department of Education's budget uh, for the end of course exams. So that, that piece of this bill is just a uh, uh, budget implementation decision. Um, there is a conceptual amendment uh, from the uh, Department of Education um, and it relates to section five of the bill. Um, if you look at Amendment 218, 
that was adopted by the Senate. In section five, it is striking uh, language related to the uh, Committee on Statewide School Safety. The conceptual amendment from the Department of Education would restore the language in section five related to the Statewide School Safety Committee. I'm not sure if there's any representatives from NDE here uh, to, that could confirm that uh, or, or provide any additional details, but that's the information I have about the, the conceptual amendment is that it would restore language in section five related to the Statewide School Safety Committee. Um, Mr. Chair, if the committee wishes to move forward with the conceptual amendment, uh, it'd be amended to pass. Um, or just to move forward, it'd be due pass. Thank you, Mr. Thorley. Uh, does the question, does the committee have any questions on Senate Bill 76? Uh, or the, uh, uh, the conceptual amendment that was presented to us in the committee meeting? Mr. Chair, uh, it looks like Sarah Nick is from NDE is on the phone. If you would like to um, have her comment at all. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions from the committee on that? I do not see any, so um, I would take a motion to amend to do pass. So moved. Uh, so I have a, uh, m a motion from Senator Dennis, a second from Senator Ratty. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. All opposed, nay. All right, and that motion passes unanimously, and, and uh, Senate Bill 76 is amend and do pass. And that came out of Senate uh, Education, so the floor statement would go to Senator Dennis. Sure. Okay, we're ready for the next one whenever you are. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Alex Hartz. The next bill is Senate Bill 210. This bill revised the provisions relating to the education of a child with an emotional disturbance. The committee heard this bill on May 3rd. Um, it was presented by Senator Don Darrell Loop with um, an assist by Bailey Bordelin. Um, the, there was a, a bit of confusion in terms of the fiscal impact of the bill. Um, after the bill hearing, the Nevada Department of Education uh, updated their fiscal note and submitted a revised fiscal note um, removing the fiscal impact that had been identified uh, pr prior to it. Therefore, there is no fiscal impact um, identified by any agencies on the bill. Uh, if there was uh, individuals who testified in support from the Clark County Family Services Department, uh, as well as District Attorney's Office, representatives from Washoe County School District, as well as the Association of School Superintendents also testified in support. There was no opposition, nor were there any comments in neutral. If the committee wishes to pass this uh, SB 210, Mr. Chair, the motion would be do pass. All right, thank you, Mr. Hartz. Um, do we have any questions on Senate Bill 210? All right, I do not see any, so uh, take a motion to do pass. So moved. I have a motion from Senator Dennis. Uh, second from Senator Kikeffer. Uh, all in favor, oh, any discussion on that motion? Do not see any. All in favor, say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. And the motion passes unanimously with the members present. And that floor statement will go to Senator Don Darrell Loop. And we can move to the next uh, bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Alex Hartz. The next bill to be work sessioned is Senate Bill 325. The committee heard this bill on Monday, May 17th. This bill establishes provisions relating to the prevention, relating to preventing the acquisition of human immunodeficiency virus. Uh, this bill was presented by Senator Settlemeyer. Um, as staff understands it, the bill seeks to allow pharmacists to perform laboratory testing uh, for HIV. The Division of Healthcare Finance and Policy fiscal note, uh, or the had a fiscal note on the bill as, as it was presented in committee. Um, it has subs the Division of Healthcare Finance and Pol 
policy, subsequently re removed the fiscal note with the bill amendment, and that was confirmed by um, Mr. Young from the uh, Division of Health Care Finance and Policy. There was uh, one caller in support of the bill um, uh, from the Retail Association of Nevada. There was no opposition, um, nor was there any testimony in neutral on the bill. Um, the, it would appear to staff that the fiscal impact has been removed as a result of the amendment to the bill. If the uh, committee wishes to pass this bill, Mr. Chair, the motion would be to do pass. Thank you, Mr. Hartz. Any questions on Senate Bill 325? Uh, I see none. Take a motion. Uh, I have a motion to pass from um, Senator Dennis, second from Senator Kikefer. Um, and all, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. All opposed, nay. And that motion passes uh, unanimously with the members present. And the floor statement will go to Senator Settlemeyer, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next bill to be work session by the committee is Senate Bill 93. This bill was heard on March 29th. Uh, this bill revises uh, provisions relating to uh, Medicaid. This bill was presented by Senator, Sen Senator Settlemeyer, excuse me. Uh, it's a, a joint bill presented by Senator Hardy. Um, this bill uh, proposes to authorize a recipient of Medicaid to receive reimbursements for personal care services. Um, and then it also addressed uh, the, su the suspension of eligibility for Medicaid of a person who is incarcerated um, to the extent that that is, that is possible to do. Um, this was, um, the purpose of this bill was to allow individuals who are Medicaid recipients to self-direct their own personal care services the Division of Healthcare Finance and Policy um, provided the committee with um, information on the fiscal impact um, of this uh, change if, if this bill is passed. Um, the uh, information provided by the Division of Healthcare Finance and Policy indicated that these services are um, matched. I believe these are matched on a 50-50 basis with regard to re uh, receiving uh, federal, re yes, federal re reimbursement versus state funds. The fiscal note indicated by the Division of Healthcare po Finance and Policy indicated that in fiscal year 22, the, impact, the fiscal impact of this bill is $50,895 in general fund appropriations that would be needed. And in fiscal year 23, one hundred and four thousand three hundred and fifty four um, dollars in general fund appropriations would be needed or one hundred and fifty five thousand two hundred and forty nine uh, dollars over the biennium. This bill doesn't have an appropriation if the committee wished to pass this bill and fund the fiscal note uh, as noted general fund the bill would need to be amended to include general fund appropriations of fifty thousand eight hundred and ninety five dollars in fiscal year twenty two and one hundred and four thousand three hundred and fifty four dollars in fiscal year twenty three thank you mr chair I'd be happy to answer any questions thank you mr hartz do we have any questions on senate bill ninety three and, and just could you clarify what that the amendment would need to, to say again um, for to add the, uh, appro the appropriate money in, in the two f fiscal years of the biennium? The amendment would, would uh, merely need to um, add general fund appropriations to the Division of Healthcare Finance and Policy. Um, staff would work with the legal division. What's more important is the um, dollar amount, 50895 or the general fund appropriations of 50895 in fiscal year 22 and $104,354 in general fund appropriations in fiscal year 23. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that for me. Um, any, any questions on, on Senate Bill 93? All right. I see none. So I would take a motion to amend due pass. So moved. 
I have a motion from Senator Dennis, second from Senator Dondero Loop. Um, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. Opposed, nay. And the motion passes unanimously, unanimously with the members present. And uh, we'll assign that to Senator Settlemeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next bill is Senate Bill 147. The committee heard this bill on uh, April 28th. This bill establishes provisions relating to conditions of release that prohibit the contact or attempted contact of certain uh, persons. Senator Harris presented the bill. As, as amended, the bill would allow non-contact orders um, to be transmitted to a central location which would be the um, Nevada Repository uh, for Criminal History. Non-contact orders, uh, the testimony included non that non-contact orders typically are not transmitted beyond court minutes and law enforcement doesn't necessarily have any record of the order and not in real time. Uh, this bill would seek to centralize data to make information available in real time to police officers. Um, Mindy McKay from the Department of Public Safety spoke to the fiscal impact, which was limited to um, one-time information technology programming so that the uh, central repository computer system was able to capture and make available the information on no, non-contact orders. Um, the, the fiscal notes that was um, provided, the unsolicited fiscal note, provided by Ms. McKay indicated $44,522 in one-time costs um, would be needed in fiscal year 22 only. Um, and so if the committee wishes to um, pass this bill with the, with the general fund appropriate, appropriation in it, then amendment, an amendment would need to be um, added to the bill to add the $44,522 in general fund appropriations, excuse me, to fund the IT programming developer costs in fiscal year 2022. 21. Ah, uh, thank you, Mr. Thorley. One option that is available to the committee is that if you, if you are in, in fact interested in funding this, um, staff would recommend that the funding be included from fiscal year 21 since it is a one-time cost on an ongoing cost. Thank you, thank you. That's a good catch. I appreciate that. And so um, any questions on Senate Bill 147? All right, I see none. I would take a motion to amend due pass. So, second. Um, and, and let me clarify, amend due pass and fiscal year 2021 funding. That is correct. Thank you. Um, so I have a motion from Senator Dennis, a second from Senator Ratty. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. Aye. All, all opposed, nay. Uh, motion passes unanimously with the members present. And that floor statement would go to Senator Harris. All right. And next bill, whenever you are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next bill for the committee's consideration is Senate Bill 175. Senate Bill 175 enacts provisions relating to lupus. More specifically, this bill uh, seeks to establish a lupus registry uh, uh, to align um, with the national lupus uh, registry and goals. Um, Senator Neal presented this bill uh, on May 3rd. Um, staff from the Division of Public and Behavioral Health spoke to the fiscal note um, that the agency had put forward. The costs are based upon developing the registry and educating providers on reporting in case abstraction. Um, there was uh, support from one individual representing the, the Nevada Rare Disease Advisory Council. There was no testimony in opposition, nor in neutral. Unlike the previous bills, uh, staff would note that in section 14, 
on page eight of the bill, lines 32 and 33 of this bill actually contains an a general fund appropriation that matches the uh, Division of Public and Behavioral Health fiscal note. Included in the bill are appropriations, uh, general fund appropriations of $87,593 in fiscal year 22 and $112,485 in fiscal year 23. Since this bill contains an, contains an appropriation already, if the committee wishes to approve this bill, it merely needs to, to, to do pass. Thank you, Mr. Hartz. Any questions on Senate Bill 175? Uh, Senator Kikhafer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm happy to see this on work session today because I think in the policy committee, I suggested that Ms. Neal just include the appropriation rather than trying to do it through a fee, and I don't want her mad at me. So, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Kikhafer. Uh, uh, I don't want her mad at me either. Um, do you, any other questions um, from the, com uh, the committee on Senate Bill 175? Seeing none, I would take a motion to do pass. So moved. I have a motion from Senator Dennis, second from Senator Canazaro. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, seeing none, just in time, Senator Neal. Uh, all in favor, aye. aye. Uh, all opposed, nay. Uh, and the motion uh, passes unanimously with the members present. Senator Kikeffer, I think Senator Neal heard us, and that's why she showed up. <laughs> Oh, so and assign the floor statement to Senator Neal. Thank you, Senator Dennis. Mr. Chair, the next bill for work session is Senate Bill 185. This bill was heard on March 29th. Uh, this bill makes an appropriation to the Department of Veteran Services to provide financial assistance and support for the Adopt-A-Vet dental program. Uh, the bill was presented by representatives from the Adopt-A-Vet Dental Program, as well as representatives um, from the Truckee Meadows Community College Dental Hygiene Program. This bill, section one of the bill, contains a general fund appropriation of $250,000 in, in 2022 and $250,000 in 2023. If the committee wishes to pass this bill, um, Staff would recommend that it, the bill be due pass. Thank you, Mr. Hartz. Do we have any question on Senate Bill 185, for the Adopt a Vet Dental Program? Seeing none, and and uh, Senator Seaver Scansert is now uh, present and in person, and. Just looking at one thing. Okay, great. So, uh, no questions on Senate Bill 185. Um, I would take a, a motion to pass. And so I have a motion from Senator Dennis, second from Senator Ratty. Um, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, um, all in favor, aye. aye. Uh, all opposed, nay. And the motion passes unanimously with all of the members present. Um, and I think that, where did that come out of? That came out of? Finance. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, it came to that interim committee. So I'll assign that to Senator um, Spearman. And I think 198 is up next whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You are correct. The next bill to work session is Senate Bill 198. This bill provides for the regulation of on-demand pay providers. This bill was heard on May 17th. Uh, Senator Canazaro presented the bill. Um, the, uh, there is uh, a testimony heard on the bill. Uh, there was none in person, uh, Ms. Sandy O'Loughlin, uh, who is the Financial Institutions Division's Commissioner, 
uh, presented information. She spoke in the neutral. Um, there was no no uh, testimony in opposition. Um, there was n other, other than Ms. Laughlin, there was no uh, testimony in neutral as well. Um, this bill uh, would, uh, there's a fiscal note provided uh, by the division which nets to zero. The division in its fiscal notes indicates that it would need a new financial institution's uh, examiner position, um, which would be funded with fees as a result of uh, regulating on-demand pay providers. And so this bill, uh, this bill and this position would be self-funding. Uh, Mr. Chair, if the committee wishes to pass this bill, the motion would be to do pass. It does not need an appropriation. Thank you, Mr. Hartz. Do we have any questions on Senate Bill 198? I see none. So, oh, Senator Severs Ganser. Um, thank you. My understanding was there, there potentially was an amendment that was coming on this bill. I, I don't know. We don't know. Uh, thank you for the question. I don't have another amendment on this bill right now. All right, thank you. Senator Kikoffer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote no today, but reserve my right to change on the floor um, as I continue to work through it. Thank you. I'm the same too. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, any other questions on Senate Bill 198? Okay. Um, uh, I take a motion for due pass. So moved. I have a motion from Senator Dennis, second from Senator Ratty. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. Aye. I'll oppose nay. So the nays are uh, uh, Kikefer, Severs Gansert, and Gokachia. Uh, motion passes, and we'll sign that floor statement to Senator Canizaro. And next up, I think we have Senate Bill 211. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senate Bill 211 uh, establishes requirements relating to testing for sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, Senator Harris presented the bill, briefly explained the purpose of the bill, and provided some stats regarding uh, STDs in Nevada. Uh, Duane Young with the Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy uh, explained the fiscal note that the agency had submitted. Um, there was a question from the committee about the testing costs uh, for HIV versus other STDs, uh, Medicaid. That information was provided by the agency yesterday and forwarded to all the committee members uh, via email yesterday evening. Uh, so you should, have all, you should have that information. Um, there was discussion about um, how the fiscal note was calculated uh, and whether uh, reductions in uh, HIV spread uh, were assumed in the fiscal note. Um, Mr. Young testified that, uh, that it was not, um, that there, there will be, the, the agency does anticipate long-term uh, cost savings down the road uh, related to this measure. Uh, however, they're not immediate cost savings that can be tied to the bill. Um, the agency's uh, fiscal note um, was a total of over the biennium of 700, or I'm sorry, 376,894. Um, the general fund portion of that would be 46,505. Uh, Mr. Young testified that that's the bottom line general fund impact uh, over the biennium. Again, that's 46,505. Uh, broken out by fiscal year, that would be 25,074 in FY22. 
and 21,431 in FY23. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, if the committee uh, wishes to uh, move this bill, uh, it would be an amend and do pass to uh, amend and include an appropriation on the bill in the amounts uh, in, for both fiscal years that I just mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Thorley. Uh, any questions on Senate Bill 211? I do not see any questions on Senate Bill 211, so I would uh, take a motion to amend due pass with so, uh, the, the um, amounts that were indicated by staff. So moved. All right, we have a, a motion, second from uh, a motion from uh, Senator Dennis, a second from Senator Don Darrow Loop. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes unanimously, and we'll assign that floor statement to Senator Harris. And with that, we can move on to Senate Bill 233. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate Bill 233 is a bill from uh, Senator Hardy with the joint sponsor, Assemblywoman Titus. Um, it's, the bill makes an appropriation uh, to the Office of Finance uh, uh, for allocation to the Nevada Health Service Corps uh, for the pur purpose of obtaining matching federal funds uh, for the program. The recommended appropriation in the bill, or I shouldn't say recommended, the actual appropriation in the bill uh, is $250,000 in each fiscal year uh, of the upcoming biennium. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Do we have any questions on Senate Bill 233? Seeing none, I take a motion. Do pass. So, so moved. A motion from Senator Dennis, a second from Senator Ratty. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion passes unanimously, and we'll sign that floor statement to Senator Hardy. And next up, we have 310. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate Bill 310, uh, sponsored by Senator Neal, uh, makes an appropriation to the Nevada System of Higher Education and requires the disbursement of certain federal money in certain circumstances to enable the College of Southern Nevada to assist and carry out the NV Grow program. Uh, Senator Neal presented the bill uh, in committee and explained the program. Uh, she te explained that the operating expenses of the program are ex approximately uh, 200000 and the, that the salaries are an additional $200,000. Um, section, section one of the bill makes a $400,000 uh, appropriation from the state general fund uh, for the, uh, to the College of Southern Nevada for the NV Grow program. Um, there was discussion about section four of the bill, uh, which was added via amendment, uh, amendment uh, number 234. Uh, section four of the bill uh, would require the disbursement of $200,000 in uh, federal funding related to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, for the NV Grow program. Um, Senator uh, Neal has submitted a conceptual amendment which would um, strike the $200 uh, disbursement number in section four, but keep all the remaining language in section four. All right, thank you. And, um, so, oh. Nope, that's it. Sorry, I was just oh. making sure I was everything. So yeah, if the... If the committee wishes to um, proceed with the conceptual amendment uh, from Senator from Senator Neal, it would be uh, to amend and do pass. Thank you, Mr. Thorley. Uh, any questions on Senate Bill 310? Seeing none, uh, 
uh, I would take a motion to amend the due pass so based moved. on the conceptual amendment. So moved. I have a motion from Senator Dennis, second from Senator Dondero Loop. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. Opposed, nay. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we'll assign that to Senator Neal. And we'll move on to Senate Bill 340 whenever you are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senate Bill 340 um, uh, was also is another bill sponsored by Senator Neal. Uh, revises provisions relating to the wages and working conditions of certain employees. Uh, Senator Neal um, introduced the bill uh, to the committee and then um, Ms. Colleen Lockhart uh, did present uh, the details of the bill. Uh, testimony was provided um, that Senate Bill 340 um, will establish um, a board uh, made up of all of all the relevant stakeholders um, regarding the fiscal impact. Um, the labor commissioner testified uh, had submitted a fiscal note. Um, uh, the fiscal note was requesting a uh, new position and the uh, and and funding associated with that position. The labor commissioner uh, testified that. Um, the fiscal impact to the Labor Commissioner's office still existed, uh, but that uh, she might be willing to remove her fiscal note as she learned more about the bill. Um, Paul Schubert from the Division of Public and Behavioral Health also testified in relation to the fiscal note that DPBH submitted. Uh, DPBH also has, uh, submitted a fiscal note re recommend requesting a position. Uh, a management analyst uh, that they say would be needed to comply with the provisions of the bill. Uh, the agency um, indicated that uh, their understanding is that position would still be needed and that this position would be an ongoing position that would need to be funded uh, beyond the upcoming fiscal year. Um, so the fiscal notes indicate two new positions. Uh, the, um, the position for the labor commissioner that they indicated in their fiscal note is a, um, if I can find the actual position. It's a compliance uh, audit investigator position uh, related to um, investigation uh, requirements of um, the Office of the Labor Commissioner as it relates to the bill. And then the, uh, again, the DPBH uh, position request is a management analyst position. The total appropriation, if the committee wishes to uh, provide fund, uh, general fund appropriations uh, and amend uh, a, an appropriation into the bill to fund these two positions would be 234,838 in FY22 and 296,204 in FY23. I'm not aware of any uh, proposed amendments um, and uh, so the motion would be to uh, to uh, to amend uh, uh, the appropriations into the bill and the amend and do pass all right thank you mr. Thorley do we have any questions on Senate bill 340 all right seeing none uh, I would take a motion to amend do pass we'll move. I have a motion from Senator Dennis and a second from Senator uh, Dondero loop any discussion on the motion? All in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, nay. nay. So I have, um, I have, uh, no's are Gokachia, Sievers-Gansert, Hammond, and Keekeffer. 
and so the motion passes and um, I'll assign that to floor statement to Senator Neal and that takes us to the last item we have to work session before we get into bills before we get into work session so this is Senate Bill 389 thank you mr. chair Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senate Bill 389 is a, another bill uh, sponsored by Senator Neal. Uh, establishes provisions governing peer-to-peer -peer car sharing programs. Um, regarding the fiscal impact of the bill, the the DMV did provide testimony at the bill at the bill hearing in Senate Finance uh, that the fiscal note that they had submitted was still valid. However, subsequent to the the hearing. Uh, we did receive an email uh, from the Department of Motor Vehicles indicating that that testimony had been provided in error and that the amendment that has already been adopted for Senate Bill 389 uh, removed the fiscal impact for the Department of Motor Vehicles. So there, there, as the bill uh, in first reprint uh, no longer has a fiscal impact on the Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, Melanie Young. Um, uh, director from the Department of Taxation uh, did confirm that their fiscal note still exists and she uh, went over the details of the fiscal note and the positions that would be needed um, to establish um, the the um, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, program uh, that's uh, in the bill um, Specifically, she talked about the staggered start dates of the positions and um, that uh, the department would re be requesting in total two tax examiners, a revenue officer, uh, and one auditor to go along with uh, the associated operating costs and IT programming. And again, they, those positions would not all start at the same time, but would start at various start dates over the biennium. Um, the the committee was interested in uh, what the estimated um, revenue impact would be from this bill, and how much revenue is anticipated or projected to be collected from the statewide 10% uh, tax on shared vehicles. Um, our revenue folks in the fiscal analysis division have looked at this and um, they estimate that the peer-to-peer -peer sharing program based on the provisions of Senate Bill 389 would generate uh, $750,000 in FY22 and a million dollars in FY23. Um, this is only the, the statewide 10% uh, numbers related to the statewide 10% tax rate. They're um, based on the information that our revenue folks have available to them. Um, they're not able to provide an estimate at this point about the 2% rates that would apply in Clark County and Washoe County. Mr. Chair, the, if the committee's wishes to um, include uh, general fund appropriations in the bill to provide uh, revenue uh, resources to the Department of Taxation for the positions that they indicated and the IT programming costs, it would be 374000 871 in FY22 and 406,699 in FY23. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, there's a conceptual amendment also. <laughs> um, there is a mock up. I'm sorry, it's not a conceptual amendment. There is mock up proposed amendment 3398 to Senate Bill 389 that sh it should be available on Nellis. Uh, it's dated May uh, 15th. Sorry, Senator. Um, so the uh, consideration for the committee would be to uh, 
consider the, the proposed amendment as well as the uh, general fund uh, for uh, appropriations for the Department of Taxation positions. Thank you, Mr. Thorley. Uh, do you have any questions uh, on Senate Bill 389? I do, and so uh, Senator Neal, if... Senator Neal, um, my question is regarding your conceptual amendment, or not your conceptual, your mock-up amendment. Um, does that achieve the goals? I know that we had two bills. We had an assembly bill and we had a Senate bill. And does that, did, did, does your mock-up amend, mock amendment incorporate all of the policy considerations that, that were in uh, the assembly bill um, into your Senate bill that, that you were talking about when you did your bill presentation? Yes, Senator Dina Neal for the record. Yes, it does. It takes in AB 429 and merges it into the tax policy with SB 389. Perfect. Thank you. And uh, thank you for doing, working with revenue to, to come up with some, some projected numbers. That's, that's very helpful and, and very needed. So I appreciate that. I have no other questions. Uh, does anyone else have any questions um, for Senator Neal? No. Okay. Um, in that case, I would uh, entertain a, a motion to amend due pass. So moved. I have a motion from Senator Dennis, a second from Senator Ratty. Any dis with the conceptual amendment? Yeah, um, the amend due pass with the mock-up amendment that we discussed. Um, and so I have a, a, a and, and the general fund and the general fund allocation in in the amendment as well. Thank you, Senator Keekhefer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I'll, I can't find the conceptual amendment, um, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to vote on. I'm going to vote yes. I think, thinking that I understand what the policy is after having had discussions um, about this bill over the course of the session, but um, just reserve my right based on what the what the language looks like when it comes out. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kikover. So we have a motion to amend due pass with the mock-up amendment and the uh, uh, appropriation, and we have a second. And do we have any discussion on that motion? Uh, seeing none, uh, uh, um, all in favor, aye. Opposed, nay. And that motion passes unanimously. And Senator Neal, uh, could give, the, give Senator Neal that floor statement, please. All right. So that's it for our work sessions right now. So we will go to the bill agenda. And today we have on the agenda seven bills. And let me pull those up. We've got uh, Senate Bill 22, Senate Bill 163, Senate Bill 276, Senate Bill 295, Senate Bill 297, Senate Bill 341, and Senate Bill 420. Um, I think that we can take those in order. Um, and so I think that we'll start with uh, Senate Bill 22. So Senate Bill 22, uh, is up whenever we're ready. We've got, thank you. Uh, we've got, this was introduced by the um, uh, Committee uh, on Judiciary on behalf of the Department of Corrections, makes various changes relating to correctional institutions. And um, I would like to remind these presenters as well as everybody else today, including people testifying and support and um, that we are here to understand the fiscal impact of this bill and um, and what uh, and to verify the costs, if any, uh, and, and not really the, the policy. I'm sure it's wonderful policy. That's why it, it made it out of your committee. Um, and so we're not necessarily here to, to, to discuss or debate the policy. So if you would, please go ahead, um, Senator Scheibel, and uh, briefly describe what the bill does and and then we'll talk about the fiscal impact. 
Thank you, Chair Brooks. Melanie Scheibel from Senate District 9 for the record. And um, I was expecting some representatives from NDOC here to also comment on the financial impact as they submitted a fiscal note, and I have discussed it with them. Well, we'll see if we, oh, I think we've All got right. someone. Yeah. We do have such representatives. Thank you. So, yeah, so just go ahead and we'll, and we'll go to that after you um, okay, present. Perfect. So very briefly, you know, as the chair of Senate Judiciary Committee, um, sorry, obviously this did come out of my committee, and so that's why I'm here to present um, SB 22 to you today. SB 22 uh, came at the request of the Nevada Department of Corrections in order to address an issue that um, surfaced in the last two years uh, since we were last in session and with the passage of Marcy's Law. It was necessary for the department to comply with that, including with the payments of restitution. Uh, finding the right way to deduct it, wages and deposits and other monies from the accounts of people who are currently incarcerated at the Nevada Department of Corrections has proved to be incredibly challenging. And um, over the last 16 months, um, the department had implemented a couple of different policies through their administrative regulation 258, which had created some um, concerns within the community, which you will hear about during the support testimony. Suffice to say that over the course of the interim, numerous family members of people who are currently incarcerated in NDOC came to the the um, ACAJ, the Administrative Committee on the Access to Justice, to um, the Interim Bail Committee, to me personally, uh, to talk about this issue, and of course to NDOC and to the Parole and Pardons Board to um, notify them that the new structure of deductions from the deposits that family members were making into their loved ones' accounts were being deducted at a rate of almost 90 to 100 percent because they were being deducted first for restitution, then for um, administrative costs for the department, then for um, child support and other obligations. And so the uh, the state of affairs about a year ago was simply untenable. Uh, NDOC did come to the table with their proposal in SB 22 to ameliorate that problem, which came before my committee um, earlier this session. Uh, NDOC was um, not prepared to agree to a particular cap in, re in statute um, and would have preferred to have done that through regulation. Um, that also presented some problems because my committee wanted to see more specific deductions and understand better what people who are going to be incarcerated at the Nevada Department of Corrections could expect to see deducted from their accounts if they were there. Um, through that process, um, I worked extensively with family members of incarcerated people, formerly incarcerated people, as well as the Nevada Department of Corrections to come up with the conceptual amendment that we passed through the committee um, on I believe it was April 9th of this year. And so that um, amendment represents a, a very hard won consensus between the parties, um, even if it was not a perfect agreement. Um, and the reason that it's not a perfect agreement is that I, it's my understanding, I don't want to speak for NDOC, but I also want to give them credit for having come to the table and done their best to work with us on this issue. But they were unable to agree to a particular statutory rate cap on these deductions. However, in the policy committee, we had a robust discussion about it and determined that it was important to include a, uh, a, a cap on the deductions from inmate accounts. And we, dis we determined that that cap should be 25% on wages earned, wait, did I say that right? No, 25% on um, uh, contributions from family members and 50% on wages earned from, um, by the people who are incarcerated themselves. Um, we chose those numbers not out of the blue, but they reflect numbers that are slightly higher than what is in NDOC's current policy, but lower than some of the other numbers that we had projected, which would have still resulted in nearly 100% deductions from inmate accounts um, if, they had, if they owed both restitution and other administrative fees, costs, and things like that. Um, at the end of the day, what you're looking at represents um, a an agreement that I thought everybody could live with and that based on my analysis would allow NDOC to re reduce or to deduct enough money from the offender's accounts to pay for restitution and the other fees and fines that, that, that are imposed on them without having to significantly undercut their bottom line. Um, I'll admit I was a little bit surprised to see the fiscal note on this and that's why I reached out to um, the ACLU who is more familiar with the process than I am and of the history of AR 258 and I think that the main 
issue um, that you'll, you'll learn about is that when the, and to be clear, what we're talking about are when people who are not in custody are sending $100, $200, $300 to their loved one who is currently incarcerated. Um, that person does not get $200 cash. They get $200 on their books to buy ramen at the commissary, to buy deodorant at the commissary. But they don't just get $200. They get $200 minus whatever the Nevada Department of Corrections takes for restitution, for fines and fees, for an administrative cost, all of those things. And so what was happening about this time last year is that individuals were, were getting maybe $10 when their loved one had deposited 100 and so um, a lot of families simply stopped making deposits at all. So whereas the Nevada Department of Corrections was getting $90 for that um, person who was incarcerated towards their administrative costs and fees, plus the $10 that went into their account, now they're getting zero. What we are suggesting is um, a model where the cap would be at 25%, so that if a loved one deposited $100 into the account of an incarcerated person, and Doc would still get $25 towards the administrative fees and costs, which is a $25 increase over the zero that they are currently getting. And the person who is incarcerated would be entitled to the 75 still minus the administrative costs and other fees. The only portion that we're capping is the very first deduction, which is for restitution to the victim. Um, and I am happy to answer some additional questions about this. I think that, again, my colleague from the ACLU can explain the history of these deductions and the mathematical um, realities with a little bit more poignancy than I can. And so if you would allow him to provide you with some background first, I think that would be um, expeditious for all of us. Thank you. Will it be helpful for us to understand the fiscal note? Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Nick Schiebeck. I am with the ACLU. Thank you, Chair Brooks and committee for having me here. Uh, so to best understand the fiscal note, we have to understand uh, a few things. If we look at page three of the most recent uh, fiscal note, um, at the very top of the page, they're showing, uh, a, they're showing the, where it says current percentage and then there's the new percentage and it takes a reimbursement down from 50 to 10. That is an old regulation. The actual changes that Nevada Department of Corrections is proposing can be seen at the bottom of page three. This bill does not require in any way that they set deductions at any specific percentages. It just caps deposits at 25% and it, uh, yeah, deductions from deposits at 25% and then deductions from wages at 50%. Now, what NDOC seems to be proposing in this fiscal note is to reduce 100% of the prison population's uh, NDOC reimbursement from 20%, which is what the current policy is, down to 10. That is not necessary for 84% of the population. Uh, only 16%, roughly, it's a little less, owe restitution. If NDOC is able to collect 25% of any family deposit, they will be able to maintain, for those who do not owe restitution, the same deduction scheme that you see on the left, on the bottom of the fiscal note. Uh, but they are adding, they, they're changing it for, for everyone. So what we're seeing in this fiscal note is a huge amount of money loss when it really should only be a small percentage of the population that is affected by these caps. On top of that, we know that families, and you will hear from these families who are being right now um, often deducted at 83%, are just not putting in any money. So they're getting 20% of money put into families who owe rest for people who owe restitution, but the families are just not putting in money because they're losing 83% of every single deposit. Uh, even at 10%, we, we, we anticipate an increase for people who owe restitution. But the fiscal note itself represents a decision that could be made internally by the department. They could choose to do this with the bill. The bill, however, does not require this statutory or this deduction scheme at all. This is something they've come up with. They can create separate deduction schemes for people who owe restitution and who do not. That is what we would suggest, but 
the bill does not require what you see here. This is just what they have decided they may do if the bill passes. On top of that, there was an earlier fiscal note on the original bill. The original bill had no caps on deductions, and that was based on internal policy. Uh, in order to come into compliance with Marcy's law, they changed the deduction schemes internally. They did this on the AR-258. They did this twice. They did this early or in September of last year. And then it was, um, then the Board of Prison Commissioners did not accept it. And then they came back at the beginning of this year and came up with this deduction scheme. But that's an internal policy. It does not have anything to do with the bill. If you do not pass the bill, the budget deficit from that original fiscal note remains the same because it is internal Nevada Department of Corrections policy, not legislation coming out of this body. Um, I can explain any of that in more detail. If you have any questions at all, I can help understand that. It might have been a little convoluted at times. No, that's, that's very helpful, actually. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, so I think, does the committee have any questions um, for uh, the the presenters or for the agency before we go to the agency though um does it anybody have any questions for senator scheibel or excuse me sir i forgot your name it's nick sheepak oh thank you and um and do we have any questions for them because i want to see if if somebody at ndoc can maybe answer a few questions all right i don't see any so if i could go to put my glasses on and go to ndoc and see if uh, if if you could maybe uh, explain the 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 rationale on the fiscal note um, in light of uh, your previous conversations with the bill sponsor and the explanation we just got. If you are talking, I cannot hear you. Uh, Department of Corrections. Yeah, I think you might be muted still. This is almost like a setup. What's going on? Can you hear me okay? I can uh, hear you Chair, now. Can you give us one okay. more? All right, um, sorry about that. Um, Venus Pajoda, Chief of Purchasing and Inmate Services, uh, for the record. Um, so based on the revision um, of this bill, um, it did implement caps um, for, again, the non-payroll deposits as well as the, the payroll deposits posted to, to inmate accounts. Um, so based on that and evaluating what we're currently allowed to deduct um, statutorily, um, we did have to make adjustments to the percentage of the existing deductions that we apply. Um, and so um, the majority of the, this fiscal note, um, the impact is going to be uh, because of the uh, lower amount of room and board that we're able to collect from um, wages. Um, we do have to reduce that. Um, we take anywhere from 24.5% to 55% based on where an inmate's housed. Um, and because of that, total cap, um, we do have to reduce that specific um, deduction. Thank you. But um, in, in the testimony we just heard, and then looking at the model you've created in your fiscal note, um, it, it, it seems as if you might be applying a percentage to a 100% of the, the population and instead of just the percentage of the population that pays restitution. And if, if that is correct, if I'm looking at that correctly or incorrectly, please um, let me know. But if it, what would that do to your fiscal note if you modified it to only um, apply that to the uh, population that owes restitution on that piece of it? And I might've just confused yes, you because I confused uh, myself. Yeah, um, I mean, you are correct. We did apply these percentage deductions um, across the board um, to 100%. 
Um, we wanted to make sure it was as consistent and equitable as possible. Um, that way, um, all of our offenders could understand um, what the, the deductions were, um, as well as staff in order to explain it when we do get asked questions. Um, and so um, if I do, uh, if I can clarify um, this fiscal note, um, this does include um, some general fund impact as well as impacts to the inmate welfare fund. So that's why I'm more so um, focusing on the room and board um, deduction because that is something that offsets general fund um, compared to the reimbursement to the department. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, do we have any questions from the committee? I sent her ratty. Thank, thank you, Chair. Do we know what percentage of the population has a restitution attached to their sentence? Um, yes, Venus so Hoda, for the record, it's approximately 17%. 17? It was, you broke up a little bit. Yes, So I think I need you to revisit that and maybe explain it to me in a different way. So why would we be applying the cap? I understand the ease of implementation argument, but if it's 17% that it truly affects, why would we do it to the other 83? Um, Venus Bohota, for the record, um, again, we did want to look at just um, applying the deductions consistently. Um, and so, so as we, as inmates pay the restitution off and then, um, you know, then to increase other, other um, deductions, we felt that that would be um, just confusing. And, and I'm probably just not familiar enough with the system and how it works, but if you're applying deductions to somebody who doesn't have to pay restitution, where is that money going? And what does it get spent on? So any remaining fund, oh, sorry, um, being a supporter for the record. Um, so if the inmates don't owe um, restitution or any of the other deductions that are that can be applied, the remainder of the money would stay on the inmates' accounts for them to use at their discretion. Aren't you deducting it from their account? We're deducting those the money from the income of the account. Correct. All right, so every financial traction has two sides on a ledger, right? So the money is coming in, it would be going to their account, but we're deducting the 20%, but because they don't have restitution, it just stays in their account. So if that's the flow of the money, that's the financial stream, and it all ends up in their account at the end of the day, no matter what, even if they don't have restitution, then why would the fiscal note be applied to 100% of the population? Um, Venus Bohota, for the record. Um, so, um, I mean, when, when looking at these caps, again, we tried to determine what we thought was the best solution. Um, you know, it's not to say that it's the perfect solution. Um, and so we are um, open to, to evaluate this further. But again, our, our concern um, as it impacts the general fund is, is to the room and form that we know we will not be able to collect. Okay. I, th I think we could, we probably do need to move off of this to the room and board, but, but I, again, I just want to make sure, I, I believe what I hear you saying is you could still apply the 20% cap evenly, which would allow you to do the implementation in a way that's easy to explain to prisoners, our clients, our guests. Um, and, but that money would still end up flowing in a way that if they didn't have restitution, it would still end up in their account. At, at the end of the day, it's still gonna end up in their account. So I guess I have to go back and look at the fiscal note to understand that piece of it. But then I do have questions about, could you articulate a little bit in a little bit more detail how then all that flows into the general fund? 
because we're talking about prisoners accounts on one side, what's the general fund impact? Yeah. Explain that to me a little bit more, please. Okay, um, Pina Hoda for the record. Um, so as part of um, the innate wages, we do apply a movement board reduction. Um, so that movement board is then used to offset um, each facility's operational costs. Um, and so if they don't receive that room and board revenue, that, that then requires each facility to ask for additional funding in order to um, operate the facility. Okay, thank you. And again, I'm probably the least fam familiar person in the room about how the system actually works. So I, I apologize and thank you for your discretion, Chair. So the concern is they won't be able to make the room and board payment because the money's going to restitution instead? Um, Venus Bahoda, for the record, it could be going restitution or any other um, deductions that may be a higher priority than the room and board, um, especially if we have that, that cap. And so I know that the restitution piece came from Marcy's Law. What does this bill do that reprioritizes that money or deducts that money in any way that's different from what you would already have to do with Marcy's Law? that would then impact our ability to pay room and board with these fees. That's actually uh, in the NRS of this bill. So, right, so the, the bill reprioritizes, like you said, uh, the restitution um, payment um, that used to be lower on the priority list. Um, but the revision um, in this bill that implements the cap actually would then allow, um, not allow us to take as much deductions that we have been able to take. Um, that, that's why it impacts the, the room and board collection that we anticipate. So we prioritized uh, restitution up to the top, which again, I think is what Marcy's Law does, and we had to do that regardless of this bill. What else did we prioritize above room and board? Um, Venus Mahota for the record. So um, the current order is specific to payroll is victim specific restitution. Um, a prison industries um, fund, um, and then um, room and board. And so is the prison industries decision in this bill different than current policy? No. So what then in this bill is different than what Marcy's law would have done or current policy that would result and a greater impact on general fund. So again, the restitution is prioritized. And so before that used to be below room and board. Um, and because of the cap, where again, we used to be able to deduct anywhere from 25 to 55% towards room and board, we now anticipate taking a lesser percentage to apply to room Okay. And so just the final question, and thank you again, Chair, your discretion has been phenomenal. Um, when you applied the reduction in room and board, did you apply it to the full population or just the 17% that would be likely to pay restitution? So all inmates who currently, whether or not they owe restitution or not. But you're current policy is to take pri prison industry first and then room and board. So nothing would change in that in this bill. It's just the 20% cap would now affect the 17% of the population that pays restitution. If they have a, a paid position, correct. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Reddy and Senator Sievers Gansert. Um, thanks, Chair Brooks. Just, just quickly, it sounds like the only the, the fiscal notice specifically related to room and board. Is that accurate? Uh, Venus for the record, yes. Okay. So, so I guess there's a couple of ways to go. Is you set room and board outside and cap that, and then keep your other cap. I know that's still more money, but to, if because if, it seems like we can't get an accurate fiscal note because they are charging it against the entire population instead of the 17%. So j just a thought with the bill, um, if, if room and board is really the only thing generating a fiscal note, maybe that's a set aside, 
or, or maybe you change the cap, just a thought. Thank you. If I may chair, uh, Melanie Scheibel for the record. Um, I'll, I'll point out that the room and board comes out of the, of the person who's incarcerated's wages and the cap that we're setting there is 50%. So what you're hearing is that if somebody makes a realistic number, $2 an hour in their prison industry's job, that the Nevada Department of Corrections is saying they need to take more than $1 of that $2 per hour to cover that person's room and board. I think they also just told us that they were taking between 20 and 55%, um, which was something that we discussed with them when we were trying to come up with a cap. Not, not being able to come to an agreement on a cap, we set 50% um, because that realistically we thought reflected the highest amount they could possibly have to take from uh, the wages that somebody is earning while they are presently incarcerated. Um, and I think that 50 and 55, we could, do a, we could try to calculate that number and see what percentage of inmates uh, we would be deducting you know, five cents less from in order to pay for their room and board and what the fiscal impact of that would be. And I imagine that it would be rather low, especially since, again, we are talking about the wages that we pay to people who are currently incarcerated, um, which are not very high. Uh, do we have any other questions from the committee members for um, Senator Scheibel or, or for the Department of Corrections? Senator Kinazaro. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I guess this is just sort of building upon um, Senator Ratty's questions because when I was looking at the language of this bill, and I understand Marcy's law, so I'll start there. We're going to prioritize restitution. But in the bill, it also changes the other items that are typically used, that are typically um, deductions from the account. So now instead of the, so now the first one would be restitution for a specific offender for restitution to a victim of their own crime, which I think was that 17% we were talking about. Prison industries, we have reprioritized the part where a portion of this goes to the individual account for the offender and instead have bumped up the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, healthcare, therapeutic community, aftercare, et cetera, deductions pursuant to 209, 246. Those are currently in statute have been reprioritized to three and four. We have taken out the language for the genetic marker tests and other fees. And so I guess I, I am also struggling just to sort of, I just wanted to kind of maybe, I don't know if I'm phrasing this in a proper question, but it seems as though there are other things that are bumping everything else that was in this list up a bit, even though we're prioritizing restitution. And I still share some of the same questions that Senator Ratty was discussing in terms of the portion of, of the population that's paying actual restitution on a crime and everyone else who is also still subject to these deductions because nothing in the bill it's all a reasonable amount determined by the director as to how much of that 25 or 50 percent you're deducting and add, putting towards these individual categories. So I'm just also struggling with the, the fiscal impact because it's, it is based on some of the other pieces here in the fiscal note where you've outlined what percentage of that deduction is going to these, to these things. And to me, it's just not... I don't know that it's really adding up with how we've reprioritized some of these other items. I don't know if that's was eloquent enough. Uh, Senator Rat, oh, well, first of all, um, do, did you want to respond to that uh, Department of Corrections? Um, and then Senator Ratty has a, a comment. Uh, can you, uh, Senator, can you uh, restate the question, please? Yes. It's, you, so we've had a long discussion about the percentage of the population that you're deducting from, right? And there's about 17% that have that individual restitution piece, which is what we're talking about reprioritizing in this bill. However, we're talking about an entire prison population that's having deductions taken. So those who don't or aren't part of that 17%, 
in theory, wouldn't be paying restitution. I'm not exactly clear first on whether that is in fact the case. Second, here, you are moving some other things around in the priority list. So I still don't understand how this has such an impact when realistically, we're talking about 17% of the population that's paying the restitution piece. And some of these other things are being bumped up on the priority list. In the bill, there is language that says the percentage of the percentage that you're taking from those wages or those account deposits for each of these individual things is an amount deemed reasonable by the director. So those are decisions that are being made by all of you as to how much of this goes to each one of these things. And so that's where I'm struggling with how we get to this fiscal impact when you look at the population who's really subject to that Marcy's Law restitution piece, and then the decisions that are being made about how much of these deductions are being applied to each one of these categories. Um, Dakota, for the record, um, again, we wanted to try to be as consistent as possible on the percentages we were applying. Um, we were concerned, you know, if, if an offender were to owe restitution, um, and so we potentially could deduct, you know, again, up to or 20%. And then if an inmate doesn't owe restitution, us then charging that specific inmate a higher room and board rate. Um, so we were concerned about equity there. Um, and so we felt that at that point it was the best decision to apply all the deduction percentages consistently. Senator Reddy. I have a, thank, thank you, Chair. I have a question for uh, fiscal staff. So what I'm wondering if we can do based on the testimony today is consider making it, I wanna just find out if this is mechanically possible, not your recommendation. Um, if we could do an appropriation on this bill that was 17% of the fiscal note, because I believe the testimony demonstrated that 17% of the population would be effective. And then somewhere, and the magic that is budgets have back language that says that the Department of Corrections could come to IFC if they can demonstrate that the general fund impact has been more than that 17% where they could ask for that um, in a process where that, that, could, that could be laid out by actual results. Uh, Wayne Thorley for the record, LCB Fiscal Analysis Division. Um, for the, the portion that the if the committee wishes to include a general fund appropriation on the bill, this, that is the committee's prerogative to include that number in any amount that the committee deems appropriate. So it certainly could be 17% of the, the fiscal note if that's what the committee wishes to do. Um, regarding the question for back language in the Appropriations Act, uh, the, the Department of Corrections uh, has access to the IFC contingency account just like other general fund appropriated agencies uh, for unexpected shortfalls. Uh, you certainly could uh, per include back language uh, specific to that, although it, it wouldn't necessarily be necessary to do that, but you certainly could. Um, you could even set aside a specific amount in the restricted portion of the contingency account uh, for the agency to come to IFC and request access to upon demonstration of certain uh, conditions. And that would make more sense in the appropriation bill than actually attaching it to this bill? Yes, the, uh, an appropriation from the general fund to the restricted, to the IFC contingency account for restricted purposes would appear in the Appropriations Act. Okay, great. Thank you for explaining that to me. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the committee of either um, Senator Scheibel or the uh, Department of Corrections? All right, um, thank you, appreciate it. Senator, oh, go right ahead. Um, if I could just make a comment, um, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, um, I did some back of the envelope math and 17% of the projected fiscal note on the amended version of SB 22 would be $334,071.33, which is less than 10,000 more than their original fiscal note on the bill that they proposed, which was $325,129. So um, I think that it is 
interesting to note that 17% of the current fiscal note is almost like equal to their original fiscal note. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. All right. Um, I will, I think we were, don't have any further questions and and um, we can go now go to uh, see if we have anyone in support of Senate Bill 22. Oh, go so so yeah. Push. There's a, a button right there by the microphone. Push that until the light comes on, and then um, state your name uh, and and spell it for the record, and then go right ahead. Okay, my name is Jody Hocking, J O D I H O C K I N G. Um, I'm the founder of Return Strong Families United for Justice for the Incarcerated, and we have, I think we're up to about almost 1,100 members now, about 500 incarcerated, and the rest are family members. So we get a wide variety of input. I wanna make two points today regarding SB 22. I could really talk about the catastrophic financial impact that this is causing to incarcerated people and to families, but today is really about the bottom dollar with us, right? And um, Director Daniels is claiming that by not taking up to 83% of the money earned and given by families to incarcerated people is gonna cost the state $3 million. First, that's based on a faulty claim that if the deductions are capped at 25% on gifts and 50% of wages, that there'll be no money left for the state to collect room and board and court fees and other monies that go to cover the state budget. It's simply not true. Marcy's law in no way requires that all money collected first go, <coughs> first go, Sorry, Marcy's law does not say that the deductions can't go to cover, the other things can't be collected. It just says that restitution has to be paid first. Someone owes other types of deductions, they can still be collected. Nothing in Marcy's law stops that from happening. The second point that I wanna impress on you is that since Director Daniels has taken leadership at NDOC, there have been repeated problems with his integrity and truthfulness in his present presentation on issues. This is no exception. We just had a whole conversation about them proposing a fiscal note that included every single person instead of the actual 17% of people that are impacted by this. This has happened with COVID numbers, the numbers of people dying, the Ely camp closing, and most recently the hoarding of COVID medications. He repeatedly gives accounts of events that are not truthful and uses data to manipulate. Could you please stick to the, um, the, the testimony on the bill and not uh, uh, insult uh, anyone's character, please? Um, I'm not trying to insult it. It's factual that these okay, are the things done. that have been Okay, you're done. Thank you. I appreciate it. Next, next um, testifier, please. Thank you. Do we have anyone else in here in support of Senate Bill 22? Do we have anybody on the phones in support of Senate Bill 22? Thank you so much, Chair Brooks. To testify in support on Senate Bill 22, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 779. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Yes, hi, my name is Nicole. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Yes, ma'am, please proceed. Okay, my name is Nicole Tate, T-A-T-E. I'm also a member of Return Strong, and I'm calling in support of the current way it's amended for SB 22. While restitution doesn't personally affect my situation, I have been through these types of deductions before regarding an injury that my husband suffered while incarcerated. He, uh, unfortunately, at the time, the bill was uh, around 60%. So in addition to all the other things deducted, if for him to be able to get, uh, if I send $100, he roughly got 30. Um, that's not sustainable for those on the outside who are unable to afford those basic things and the people inside who actually need those funds to be able to provide foods, hygiene needs, laundry needs, uh, clothing, and other things like that, as well as medical bills and, and um, co-pays. Um, 
it's just uh, unfortunate that it has to come to this. However, it is a very gra- uh, sorry. My apologies. It is a great um, hurt to those on the outside who are trying to fund these people's their loved ones on the inside's um, basic needs. Um, and quite frankly, there's many who aren't going to be able to afford to send any funds at all, as previously stated. If the if the current actions um, go up in uh, the amount that's taken, so I sincerely hope that you pass it as amended. Uh, thank you for your time, and you guys have a good day. Thank you. Next caller, please. Thank you, Chair. Caller with the last three digits, 299. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hello, my name is Nicole Williams, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S. I am also a member of Return Strong, and I agree with the previous speaker and ask for the committee to move this bill forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Thank you, Chair. Caller with the last three digits, 151. Please slowly state and spell your name. For the record, you will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Denise Bolaños, D-E-N-I-S-E-B-O-L-A-N-O-S, and I am also a member of Return Strong. And I hadn't intended to speak on this bill today because I didn't really see what I could say at a Senate Finance Committee that would be of relevance because, well, it's finance, right? But then I thought about my finances and that of my family and how for the past couple weeks I have not slept properly thinking about how many financial issues I'm having at this time. I have three kids, two jobs, and an incarcerated husband who is subject to 83% deductions of any deposits made by us, his family. And these deductions truly created an entirely new crisis for families of incarcerated people um, and incarcerated people themselves. And um, I'll just give just the most recent example because there's too many to fit into this time space. Aside from my Monday through Friday nine to five job, I have a part-time job from home and I'm self-employed. I recently ordered a $78 package from Amazon containing printer ink, paper, envelopes, and pens. Well, in my hurry to manage life, I didn't double check the address and it was sent to the prison my husband is housed in. I called right away. It was too late to cancel. I called the prison and let them know what had happened, and they said, no problem, we will return the sender. Well, what I didn't know is that my husband must pay for that return. I was not allowed to pay for it directly. He has to pay $15 out of his inmate account, and for us to afford that $15 shipping fee, I would need to deposit $86 because his account is currently at zero since I haven't been able to afford to send him any money for the past few months due to these deductions. A 25% cap on family deposits would make that so much more manageable. But long story short, the package had to be tossed and I reordered the item because it ended up costing less. And of course, I was at fault for this, but my intention is just to demonstrate how these deductions on deposits are so astronomical and how they significantly impact our everyday life. How a simple mistake that everyone is subject to make ended up costing me nearly $200. Thank you for your time. Please pass SB 22 as amended. Thank you. Um, Next caller, please. Thank you, Chair. Caller with the last three digits, 846. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hello, my name is Adrian Lowry, A-D-R-I-A-N-L-O-W-R-Y. I'm calling to support the previous speakers on this bill and support the bill as amended. The constitutional amendment that was passed by voters known as Marcy's Law specifies that all money collected must first go to victim restitution if the person is required to pay restitution. The constitutional amendment, which was uh, which has already passed, obviously has a large impact on NDOC. So they have been throwing all kinds of things out to try to get around or ignore that requirement. I just wanted to mention that because the fiscal impact of Marcy's Law is being wrongly attributed to this bill. Marcy's Law already passed, it's already in effect, and they already lost that money for NDOC expenses. NDOC first took up to 80% from family contributions, and it's not clear that that money was applied to restitution. After outrage from the community, they were told by the Prison Board of Commissioners to go back to previous deduction limits, but NDOC did not do this. They reduced the amount applied specifically for restitution, but they continued to take large amounts on top of that for NDOC expenses continuing to deduct from 50 to 80% from incarcerated people. 
I do not believe that this fiscal note is valid because they are once again trying to undermine the text of the constitutional amendment in order to cover their own their own when the money is required to be used for other purposes, and they are trying to say that the money they are losing because of that constitutional amendment is instead due to this bill. I would once again state that the constitutional amendment was passed by the voters of Nevada and is already in effect, but NDOC is trying to say that the losses from that amendment are due to this bill, and once again state that constitutional amendment uh, says that all the specified money collected by NDOC must be applied for its restitution, not to NDOC expenses. For that reason, this fiscal note is not valid. The money has already been subtracted from NDOC's operations account by the constitutional amendment. And then also mentioned that they want to present this idea as if families are still going to spend in $100, knowing that $80 is going to be subtracted from that or $70 or however many that they decide to take. But families cannot afford to do that. They're not going to, they're not going to spend a hundred dollars to give twenty dollars. I mean, they would if they could. Could you, sure, but. could you wrap up so we can make room for other callers, please? Yeah, sure. But it's you know, they can't afford to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, next caller, please. Thank you, Chair. We are currently in support testimony on Senate Bill 22. If you have joined the call and would like to testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no additional callers in support at this time. Thank you. Uh, do we have anybody here in the um, committee room that's in opposition to Senate Bill 22? I do not see any. Do we have anybody on the phones in opposition to Senate Bill 22? Thank you, Chair. To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 22, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 534, please press star six to unmute. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Morelli Rodriguez, R O D R I G U E V. I'm actually in support of SB 22 amended bill. Um, I just want to use an example. A friend of mine made $50 in gross wages. They took 24 50 cents in room and board, 5% capital fund, 5% PI fund, 10% savings, leaving him with $1.17 and 5% PI fund. Um, so I just agree with all the other callers, callers and uh, that's all I wanted to share through today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could we go back to opposition, please? Certainly. Thank you, Chair. As a reminder, we are currently on opposition testimony on Senate Bill 22. If you have joined the call and would like to testify in opposition, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Oh, thank you. Do we have anyone in neutral to Senate Bill 22? Either here, we do not, on the phones. Thank you, Chair. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 22, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. So we can close the hearing on Senate Bill 22, unless uh, Senator Scheibel, unless you had any closing. Oh, we lost Senator Scheibel. Okay. Uh, so we'll move on to the next bill. And our next bill on the agenda. Wow, this one's a, this was a, a, a nice, easy one. It's Senate Bill 163 from Senator Spearman. Welcome, Senator Spearman. Um, and uh, Mr. Thorley, if you could, uh, I, I recall this fiscal impact, but if you could explain it to us briefly, that'd be great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
The uh, Department of Motor Vehicles did submit a fiscal note uh, for Senate Bill uh, 163. Uh, the, the specific fiscal impact uh, for this bill, they indicated um, they would need um, approximately 761 hours of programming and uh, that that program can be completed in-house. Uh, however, they did note that there are several other bills uh, affecting the programming of their systems and that uh, it's difficult to estimate the workload and that they may, uh, given all the bills that are out there and not knowing which ones will pass. And so uh, as has been done pre in prior sessions, um, they uh, have indicated uh, that they may need uh, an appropriation um, later in session related to the cumulative effect of the fiscal notes uh, or fiscal impact of all the bills affecting their system, but this specific fiscal, uh, fiscal note is zero dollars. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Pushing the wrong button, sorry. <laughs> Senator Spearman, um, you know, I, we're obviously talking about the fiscal impact, so whatever comments you might have. Yes, sir, and I believe uh, Mr. Severs is on the uh, phone as well. Uh, the other thing we did, you'll see the fiscal impact also included the inability to get it done by October 1st. So we moved it to February 1st, which is the beginning of Black History Month. Okay, do we have online? Do we have someone? Are they on video or are they on the phone? He's on the phone. On the on phone. The phone. The BPS, you might need to look to see if somebody is on the phone line. I believe it'll be uh, Mr. Sean Sever. Mr. Sean Sever, if you are on the public comment line, please press star nine to raise your hand. Thank you, caller. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, committee members. This is Sean Sever from the DMV, S-E-A-N-S-E-V-E-R. And uh, I'm testifying on the behalf, behalf of the DMV. Um, as Mr. Thorley said, um, this was a zero impact fiscal note for us. Um, but the effect for us is if we have, you know, multiple zero uh, fiscal notes that add up to something in the end and programming, then we come back and ask for uh, the IFC to to reimburse us. So anyway, um, yeah, we're we're neutral on the bill. Um, I, can, I can take any questions at this point. Hi, uh, Mr. Sever. This is uh, uh, um, uh, Chair Brooks. And so my question is, you say you have 761 hours of programming that you can absorb. That's half an FTE. Um, and um, just on this one bill and then you um, so does uh, does the DMV have any open positions is the DMV requesting any more positions or does the DMV have uh, half an FTE to spare and so unfortunately Senator Spearman's bill happens to be the one that got caught in this line of questioning but um, and then y y you say that you know you reserve you, you reserve the right to come back to IFC and ask for more money well, which is it? Do you need more people? Do you have extra people? Does this, you going to be able to absorb this or do you need to charge, uh, come back to IFC and ask for more money? I, this, this, I, I just think this is wildly inconsistent. Yeah, so uh, Sean Sever from the DMV for the record. Um, we, uh, this particular bill, we, we say that there's no impact, but the, the, if there's a, a bunch of bills that add up to something, then, then we reserve the right to come back. But in this particular case, no, no we can absorb the programming for this particular task. Um, and, and, you know, the DMV, we don't have extra positions open that can do this. It's just um, uh, something we're willing to absorb at this point. So until other bills pass and we see which ones are moving forward, we don't really... I really can't answer that question at this point. Thank you, Mr. Sever. And I understand the, the cumulative effect of a lot of small changes, but 761 hours. So this is a zero fiscal note and we'll take it as such, but um, 
this would be probably the last one that I would ever want to see that says you can absorb 761 hours while you're looking for new positions to fill. Any other questions? <laughs> All right. Thank you, Senator Spearman. Thank you, Mr. Sever. Thank you. Um, and uh, if we have no other comments or questions, I think we could uh, um, take a motion. Or, no, I'm sorry. We're in a bill hearing, <laughs> not in a work session. Um, but I, I think that uh, I have no other comments. I don't think anyone else has any other questions. So we'll see if we have anyone in support of uh, Senate Bill um, 60, 163. I don't see anyone here. Um, do we have anyone on the phones in support of Senate Bill 163? Thank you, Chair. To testify in support on Senate Bill 163, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you. Do we have anyone in opposition to Senate Bill 163? Thank you, Chair. To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 163, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Do we have anyone in neutral? Thank you, Chair. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 163, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, this is Sean Sever from the DMV again, if I may. Are you calling in neutral? Or are you responding to my earlier yeah, I, I, question? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm in a neutral position. Okay, thank you. Uh, once again, Sean Sever, Sean Sever from the DMV. Um, we wanted to thank Senator Spearman for moving the date uh, on this bill. Um, we have a very large transformation project coming to the DMV. We're trying to move all of our services online. And then we also have legislative bills uh, coming our way. So um, we do appreciate her uh, working with us on this bill. The, the note we put on all of our fiscal notes is just a standard line we, we put on there. Um, but, but in this particular case for this bill, uh, we think we can handle it in-house, the cost. So just wanted to clarify that for you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sever, for clarifying that. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, do we have anyone else on the phone and neutral? Thank you, Chair. Uh, we are currently in neutral testimony on Senate Bill 163. If you would like to testify in neutral, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no additional callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 163. And um, and I would like to, before we go on to the next bill, since we have Senator Spearman here, and I think this is uh, a pretty simple um, uh, outcome from, from the hearing, uh, would like to work session Senate Bill 163. And um, if we have any questions for the Senator um, on, on the work session from the committee, we see none, so could I take a motion to do pass? Second. And we have a motion from Senator Ratty, do pass. Second from Senator Dennis. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, seeing none, all in favor, aye. aye. Against, nay. And uh, we have one nay from Senator Hammond. And so the motion passes. And uh, Senator uh, Spearman will assign you that floor statement, please. Yes. All right. Cool. We'll get back into our agenda then. And I think the next bill we have up is Senate Bill 276. And that is Senator Dennis.
Senate Bill 276 uh, is um, sponsored by Senator Dennis and poses technology fee for the issuance of, or renewal of certain licenses, certificates, permits, and registrations issued by the Real Estate Division of the Department of Business and Industry. And Senator Dennis, please go ahead. And, and do we have somebody? We do. My glasses on. All right, thank you. Mr. Chandra, okay, so go ahead, Senator Dennis. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman um, and members of the committee. Record, for the record, Mo Dennis representing Senate District 2 in Clark County um, and uh, here to present uh, Senate Bill 276 and uh, trying to do the short version, which is short anyways. Um, I also have, um, as you already mentioned, Mr. Uh, Sharath Chandra is available um, to answer any questions uh, in um, Rocky Finseth is also here. Um, just a real quick background. Every year our state's information technology becomes outdated by, uh, by the time state um, and by the time state agencies come to the legislature to request funding for IT modernization, we run into the issue of trying to find the appropriate funds. Um, and now the COVID-19 pandemic raised demands uh, for government work and services in many unexpected and rapid changing ways. Uh, for example, the rapid transition to remote work required more automated business processes so agencies can operate with minimal paper and in-office staff. It's also important that these remote capabilities do not compromise IT security or data privacy. Quick, it's quickly becoming clear that older enterprise systems and processes cannot keep pace with many emerging government needs. As we look ahead to the uh, post-pandemic future, we need to acknowledge the, the revenue decline, um, which makes it vital to identify every opportunity to cost control and operational efficiencies. In addition, we need a resilient technology platform to maintain service continuity during unforeseen conditions that stress or, reduce the, uh, or re disrupt the business environment. The IT modernization needs vary between state agencies, but ultimately is necessary to leverage technology to meet expanding goals and streamline services offered to our residents and consumers. Um, for these reasons, uh, SB 276 imposes a fee specifically dedicated to improving the technology needs of the real estate division of the Department of Business and Industry. Um, the bill establishes a $15 technology fee imposed to each applicant for the issuance or renewal of certain licenses, certificates, permits, and registrations issued by the real estate division. In addition, the bill creates various technology accounts, chapter 645, real estate brokers and salespersons, 645C, appraisers of real estate and appraiser, uh, appraisal management companies, 645D, inspectors of structures and energy auditors, uh, 645H, asset management companies and asset managers, and 119A, timeshares, uh, the Nevada Rice statutes and in the state general fund administered by the division. Any interest in earn, income earned must be credited to the accounts and any remaining balance in the account does not revert to the state general fund. Finally, the bill requires the money collected from the technology fee to be deposited in the respective account governing certain professions or occupations and be accounted for and used for acquiring or improving the technology used by the division for administering the respective profession, um, professions. And I, I will add, um, with the uh, pandemic, uh, what we've seen actually with real estate prices, they, 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 as you've seen, they've been going up. and. Um, the the uh, forecast is that that's going to continue to happen for the next five years. Um, with that, we've seen an increase in real estate salespersons and brokers um, increasing, and uh, um, and so the need to have technology that's modern and, and can actually meet the needs of the current um, industry is what brought the industry forward to say that they needed this. Um, we also additionally. Um, had have a bill before us to uh, fund actually the new to the upgrade to the technology um, but in addition to that we're going to need to be able to continue to keep that technology up to date and so that's why uh, the fee is necessary so that 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 technology can continue to be uh, kept up up to date um, one example that i always give is um, re real estate um, salespeople are required to do continuing education um, well, when you take a class, um, you have to keep the physical copy of the paper because the, the schools that teach it can't submit it um, automatically. Um, and so every, every person has, to, has this issue, issue that they have to keep track of all of this and then submit it uh, physically. 
Um, and so trying to make it more efficient for the profession um, is, is, is what the uh, technology fee is going to allow to do. So with that, um, Mr. Chair, that's uh, the basics of the, of the bill. And uh, as I mentioned, we have um, uh, Chandra Sharath, uh, Sharath Chandra here with us also that could answer um, questions. And he may have some additional information that you might need as far as for the fiscal side of this. Great, thank you, Senator Dennis. And um, uh, I do have a question, Mr. Chandra. So it, it looks like it's revenue neutral. The fees equal the expenses, and 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 so there's not any fiscal impact necessarily on the agency. Um, and just you know, do, do you have feel that they're they are needed, oh, and and the way that they're being described, it could be beneficial to the agency. Good afternoon, Chair Brooks, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear. Uh, just wanted to thank Senator Dennis, uh, first and foremost, for all the work he's put into this one. So, uh, Chair, to answer your question, I think it, it would be definitely beneficial. Um, again, I know you focus on the fiscal aspect of it, and you're absolutely correct. It's just a net revenue uh, for the division, which can be used by the division to enhance the technology. And the fiscal note on there was just basically describing what that analysis looks like. Um, and we approximate about $250,000. The point that also I wanted to make quickly, uh, Chair, is that it's a two-year renewal cycle. So it's once every two years that the $15 would be applied against the license. Um, and so that generates about $250,000 annually. Uh, and I'll... I'll I'll stop and I'll happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, committee, do you have any questions for Senator Dennis or Mr. Chandra? Uh, I do not see any. Uh, Mr. Finseth, were you going to uh, add add to that? If I could, Mr. Chairman, Thank thanks, you. Uh, Rocky Finseth, for the record um, with Career Nevada here on behalf of the Nevada Association or Nevada Realtors. Uh, first, we want to thank Senator Dennis for carrying this bill, um, Director Chandra for um, working with us. The industry is in full support of this. We've actually asked for this um, sev for several sessions, and we're pleased that Senator Dennis was able to bring this bill forward. Um, so we thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the committee? All right. Thank you. So um, thank you, Senator Dennis. And um, do we have anyone here in support of Senate Bill 276? Do we have anybody on the phones in support of Senate Bill 276? Thank you, Chair. To testify in support on Senate Bill 276, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you. Do we have anyone in opposition to Senate Bill 276? Do we have anyone on, on the phones in opposition to Senate Bill 276? Thank you, Chair. To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 276, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Do we have anyone in neutral on Senate Bill 276? Thank you, Chair. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 276, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, we can close our hearing on Senate Bill 276, and we will open our hearing on Senate Bill 295. Senate Bill 295 is presented or uh, sponsored by Senator Canazaro, and it revises provisions relating to industrial insurance. Do you want to sit? Okay, okay. 
uh, and it was referred to Committee on Commerce and Labor. And um, we have Senator Ken Azaro and looks like the Mr. Inglesby and um, Mr. Thorley, if you have uh, could give any information for us on the fiscal impact of this bill. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Uh, Wayne Thorley for the record, LCB Fiscal Analysis Division. Um, there are several fiscal notes uh, attached to Senate Bill 295 on Nellis. Um, I would call the committee's attention to the, the, the two fiscal notes from the De Department of Administration uh, Risk Management Division. Uh, they submitted an unsolicited fiscal note on the bills introduced, uh, and then also a, a subsequent unsolicited fiscal note on the first reprint of the bill. Um, the, uh, the division's fiscal note relates to the uh, language in the bill that indicates that insurers may not terminate, suspend, withhold, offset, reduce, or otherwise uh, halt, restrict, or limit the payment of compensation for permanent total disability uh, to certain injured firefighters, arson investigators, police officers, or emergency medical attendants or their dependents on the basis that the injured employee earns income. Um, there are projections provided by the risk management division. Uh, you can uh, see in the fiscal note, uh, uh, they made projections based off of um, uh, certain assumptions that are included in the fiscal note. In total, they, they estimated a fiscal impact of um, about, uh, about $800,000 over the biennium. Thank you, Mr. Thorley. Um, and Senator Canizaro, if you could briefly walk us through what this bill does and why it might be perceived to create a fiscal note. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Nicole Canazaro, Senate District 6. Um, so Senate Bill 295 clarifies in its first reprinted version that members of police and fire who have heart and lung uh, claims who qualify for permanent total disability, and those are the, that's the very specific and narrow category of employees that we are talking about would not have a reduction in their benefits if they had outside employment. Um, the gist of it is, in the most simplest terms, um, is that a lot of these employees who have those qualified heart and lung issues that are related to their service um, as police and fire are oftentimes not incapable of doing another job such that we would think of in terms of, of typical permanent total disability, but rather they have suffered that particular industry in injury as a result of their employment um, and are simply then not physically capable of meeting all of the requirements that are necessary to maintain their employment as police or fire. Um, and so this bill seeks to <coughs> clarify that those particular benefits cannot be reduced simply because there may be some outside stream of, of um, income. Currently, we believe that that is how the law is being read, and currently that is how it is being applied. Um, we had an opportunity to speak with the Department of Administration to walk through the fiscal notes and to get some answers. Um, the committee will note that there was, originally the bill as drafted had included just all employees. We wanted it to be specific to police and fire, heart and lung claims only, so not other claims. Um, and so that was one of the amendments that was brought forth in the committee. What we thought was interesting and wanted some questions on was the Department of Administration in the first um, fiscal note had a much lower number um, of fiscal, a much lower fiscal impact than when we even restricted it to just police, fire, heart and lung. Um, and so we asked that question. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that there was a significant answer there, but with respect to the fiscal note for this, for the first reprint, um, our understanding is that these 27 employees that are identified in the fiscal note are currently being paid their full benefits. Um, so this bill that then would ensure that they continue to receive full benefits um, would entitle those same 27 employees since 2001 27 employees since 2001 to keep getting those full benefits. Um, my understanding of the reason for the fiscal note, although I, I do think we got some clarification on that piece of it after speaking with the Department of Administration, um, is that this would not have an immediate fiscal impact because those same 27 claimants 
would still be receiving the same benefits they are receiving now. What was pointed out during those conversations was that if the division, or excuse me, if the department had additional staff to do investigations, they might find that some of these individuals are currently earning outside income and then would try to reduce those benefits, but, but that is not currently the case. And so that was one piece of the reasoning for the fiscal note. And then the second piece that we were offered was that they believe by putting this language into statute and clarifying what we believe is, is current, current practice um, that other individuals who would qualify for heart and lung would seek outside employment and they would want to be able to reduce those benefits. And so there is a future value to the taxpayer impact um, from our perspective, and we didn't get a revised fiscal note, um, but after our conversations, there was some communications with the Department of Administration that there is not an immediate fiscal impact because those same 27 employees, which are the same claims that they've had over the course of the last 20 years, um, the 27 employees since 2001 are getting full benefits. Senate Bill 295 would ensure they continue to receive those full benefits. It would also mean full benefits for any future police fire who have heart or lung claims that are approved for, for permanent total disability. Um, so that's sort of a brief walkthrough of, I guess, my best explanation of the fiscal note and what the bill is intending to do. Um, and, and I don't know, I do have Mr. Inglesby here with me as well, um, who's been working on the bill and can provide some additional explanation about that if the committee desires. And I do believe I see Laura Freed from the Department of Administration there as well. Um, who was part of those conversations that we had. And then I think we also had Jason Mills in case there was any other technical questions about the status of the law and, and how we had walked through this. But from our perspective, our understanding is there is no fiscal impact currently because it doesn't change how these benefits are currently being administered. Thank you, Senator. And before I, I go to uh, Director Freed, um, Mr. Inglesby, is there anything you wanted to add um, to the explanation uh, to the bill or the understanding of the bill uh, that uh, I think Senator Canazaro did a good job of really kind of spelling it out for me. Uh, Chairman Brooks, Jason Mills, Nevada Justice Association. So, uh, no, nothing to add. I just wanted to let let everyone know I was here if you, if you needed me. I'm actually in a district court hearing too at the same time. <laughs> well, we see you. We see you, Mr. Mills. And if we need you, we'll, we'll, we'll call on you. And uh, But Mr. Inglesby, have you had anything to add at all? Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, uh, not at this time. I think she summed it up perfectly. Uh, again, um, we're just confused on how, what law or what statute they're using that they're going to start implementing this. Um, this was just brought to us because a third party, uh, we've had some third party claims against our members, uh, and we're not sure what law they're claiming they're following either, or statute. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Director Freed, if we could um, go to the fiscal note that you sent, the unsolicited fiscal note um, on, it would have been on, I guess, the, uh, this is a reprint. Um, and, Correct, Mr. Chair. And so, and, and basically the, the effect in the, in the biennium $740,000, and I see the calculations that you're doing that and you know, so you're making some assumptions 25 percent but what i really don't understand is currently you're you're currently paying these 27 claims right now mm -hmm. based upon your current interpretation and so i don't see how there's the this any any sort of a reduction or an expense like I, I'm, I'm just it's re i'm really struggling with how the justification for the fiscal note, any fiscal note, let alone this particular fiscal note on this particular um, piece of legislation. So please help me understand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Laura Freed for the record, Department of Administration. This fiscal note is not, um, you know, usually when you're asked for a fiscal note, it's because somebody wants to do a thing and it costs money to do the, the new thing. This one's a little more subtle than that um, because this is money that presumably we already pay out, right? But the change in the statute doesn't allow the state through its third party administrator to eliminate reserves for permanent total disability for police fire should they gain employment after electing permanent total disability. 
So the state currently has a fully funded high deductible plan where the state pays dollar for dollar on the claims till the retention is met and that's $2 million. Um, permanent total disability for police fire is some of our most expensive claims we pay. Um, and you, we can tell that because it's we have outstanding reserve for permanent total disability compensation um, of about $6.3 million that we have to maintain. So, you know, the majority leader provided a, a fairly good summation of our discussion about this, and I thank her for that. Um, she's right. There's 27 claims um, where a police officer or a firefighter has elected permanent total disability uh, right now. Uh, we currently have 33 open claims for heart and lung benefits um, that are currently have not elected permanent total disability. So based on the proposed change to the law, um, we can assume some of those officers would elect to, uh, permanent total disability. Um, the other thing to note is heart lung claims are, is one of our largest unsecured liabilities. So that correlates to our exposure, which affects our premium and our collateral required. So really, I mean, this, this comes down to the rates. I mean, you know, the majority leader is right, and you are right, Mr. Chairman, that states are already going to spend money on heart lung benefits that were elected by police and fire. Um, but yes, the, the current law, um, which is NRS 616C440 sub 3, um, is what we and what people who have elected PTD um, use to understand that if they go out and earn a different living after electing permanent total disability, that jeopardizes their benefits. Um, you know, as I told the uh, uh, Mr. Inglesby, um, we know that's true because the risk manager and the TPA have discussed uh, with the bill sponsor that, you know, those employees contact us to confirm that they'd have their benefits reduced if they got a different job. Um, and so, um, again, to the majority leader's uh, very good summary, if the Department of Administration were to investigate cases where we suspect a person was working in another occupation after electing permanent total disability, we would reduce or even eliminate the benefits um, based on 616C440 sub 3. So, uh, and of course, we don't have those resources. The risk management budget has seven people in it. Um, so to preclude the state from reducing benefits under SB 295 would mean that the state is definitely committed to those expenditures with no possibility of reducing them, which is where the, um, the majority leader's comment about taxpayer value comes in. Um, and then of course, if employees understood that they would not be subject to reduce benefits if they obtain work after electing total disability, then yes, we expect more people would elect permanent total disability. Um, but to the comment that, you know, no fiscal impact this biennium, I wouldn't say, well, if we're talking about FY22 and 23, I wouldn't say no fiscal impact. I, I believe I said there wouldn't be much immediate fiscal effect. And that's true because we have our policies bought for this biennium. The real effect comes in future biennia as heart lung costs increase overall, and we have to go out and obtain more expensive workers' comp policies. So really what it means is it affects the rates for workers' comp that are charged to other agencies in future biennia. And that pretty much uh, summarizes my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. That, that was a good explanation. I appreciate that. Um, do we have any uh, questions from the committee, either for um, Senator Canizaro or for Director Freed? And um, maybe, Mr. Mills, if there's anything briefly you can add to this, um, uh, I'd appreciate that. Uh, Chairman Brooks, Jason Mills um, from Nevada Justice. No, basically, the, the, the issue, as it boils down to, is, is that there, there does not exist in law the, the right to, to offset or reduce PTD benefits currently. 616C440 is there so that in the event a, 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 an insurer can show that the person no longer has the condition for which they are suffering under for PTD benefits, then the insurer can withdraw those benefits. So for example, if they were able to prove that the heart disease was gone and they can go back to being a firefighter, then they would be able to lift the PTD benefits. But if they if the heart disease is still there and they can't be a firefighter still, working at Walmart doesn't take the benefit away now 
or by any law that currently exists. So that's why I believe Senator Cannizzaro, uh, myself, and uh, and uh, Mr. Inglesby believe that there is no law that currently allows them to do this. Hence, this change or this clarification uh, or codification, it, it 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 doesn't result in any fiscal impact because it can't be done already. And that that that's why that's why I believe the senator was looking. Uh, uh, for that, what is the actual impact, and how are these benefits actually withdrawn? And uh, and our understanding is they're not; they can't be. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Thank you, Mr. Mills. D does anyone have any questions for uh, Mr. Mills on that particular point? And thank you for sending the. Um, I, I saw some um, that analysis that you had done in an email that you had sent to the committee, and uh, or to myself. I appreciate that. Um, yes. So. I mean, that kind of, I think, is, is kind of the, the, the pivotal point in this whole conversation. If, if there's not a potential legally for to claw back any benefits on permanent partial disability or permanent total disability, then what is the, the potential loss that, that is being calculated in this, um, in this fiscal note? And so that, that's really kind of where it comes down to me, that I do not see how there's the opportunity to have any potential loss. If, if, and, and Ms. Freed, have, have, have you, has, the, has your plan ever clawed back any um, partial total disability based on the, current, the statutes as you currently understand them? Because a, a person who still had the, the PTD uh, got some employment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Laura Freed for the record. Um, I just want to note, you know, this point of law is something that Mr. Mills and the lawyer for our TPA disagree on. We had a very spirited discussion about it. Um, and our TPA stands firm that they would terminate benefits based on 616-440 step three. Um, and, the re and we don't think he's alone in that because uh, we know that there is a case pending before the Supreme Court out of a jurisdiction in Southern Nevada where they did claw back benefits. But as for ourselves, no, we have not ever because, again, we're under-resourced to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the committee for any of the folks? All right. Um, do you have uh, any any final comments, uh, Senator Canazar? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Nicole Canazaro, Senate District Six. I think the salient point is that certainly that's a policy decision as to whether or not we would want to pass Senate Bill 295 to say that we are not going to claw those back. But from a practical perspective, and for this committee's um, edification and concerns with respect to the fiscal note. This bill does not change what is currently being paid out. And if the issue is higher workers' comp rates because of the increased expense for heart lung claims, I think that that was that point was made, but that seems to be related to cost for health care. Um, and and certainly when we're talking about police fire who elect to take PTD benefits because of heart and lung, it is because a doctor has come in and said, you can no longer work this job because you do not meet the physical requirements. Um, and sometimes that happens, you know, at year 35 when they're retiring. Sometimes that happens at year 10 when they just began their career and they just can't work that particular job anymore, even though, you know, something, I think the example was a Walmart reader would be a perfectly fine piece of employment for them to have. Um, and currently, clawbacks are not taking place for these employees. They don't take place for the 27 employees that have elected, elected PTD over the last 20 years. And so we don't think that this would change from a fiscal impact standpoint, um, any of the, the money that the state is currently paying to these individuals. Thank you, Senator. Any questions or comments from the committee? All right, thank you. Um, with that, we'll uh, go to support for Senate Bill 295. Um, here in the in the room. Um, all right, we'll go to the phones for support to Senate Bill 295 broadcast services. If do we have anyone on the line? Thank you, Chair. To testify in support on Senate Bill 295, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. 
color with the last three digits, 689. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, Tom, T-O-M, last name Dunn, D-U-N-N, uh, representing the professional firefighters in Nevada, as well as the Reno, uh, City of Reno firefighters and Reno Airport firefighters. I think it's important to clarify that this does not increase any current existing benefit. And in order to qualify for this benefit, a police officer or firefighter has to be diagnosed with heart or lung disease that developed during the course and scope of their employment by a physician. So you either have heart and lung disease or you do not. More than likely, the physician has told the employee that they can no longer work as a police officer or firefighter and has placed them on a work restriction. Only then can the employee select permanent total disability under NRS 617-455 or 617-457. I've been working on firefighter issues and health and safety, uh, cancer, heart and lung for the last decade, and I am not aware of a single heart and lung claim where a police officer or firefighter had to retire with a heart and lung disease diagnosis, have their disease reverse during retirement, and be eligible to return to full duty. Uh, this comment about 617-440, if you have employers or third-party administrators that are now clawing back or reducing a benefit or delaying a benefit, it's my opinion that that's a violation of, of state law and statute. And maybe we should address it uh, next session with uh, uh, some sort of penalty or additional clarification of what either is or is not allowed under the law. So uh, in closing today, um, I also have provided a, uh, to the committee a copy of my uh, statements to the Senate Commerce and Labor Committee on April 2nd, and I am uh, respectfully asking you to support SB 295 and pass it out of committee. Thank you. Caller with the last three digits, 555. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hello, Mr. Chairman. My name is Bill Gardner, B-I-L-L-G-A-R-D-N-E-R. -L -L -E and I'm calling in support of this, of passing this legislation out of committee. I'm calling representing the firefighters of the city of North Las Vegas. Uh, this is extremely important for us because when someone is declared uh, permanently disabled, it also, uh, in addition to their benefits being uh, paid out, there's a reduction in the hours that they would normally work. I think it's important for people to remember how many hours a firefighter works compared to a, uh, a person who works a 40-hour work week. So when they're no longer able to work that physical job anymore, they sometimes find it necessary to supplement those benefits a little bit to maintain status quo with the type of job that Mr. Mills had mentioned before, doing something that is not as physically demanding. So it's extremely important for us as firefighters and police officers for this legislation to codify what we believe already exists. So please support and pass out a committee. Thank you very much for your time. Caller with the last three digits, 402. Please press star six to unmute. Thank you, caller. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Hi, uh, my name is Ryan Green, R-Y-A-N-G-R-E-E-N. -E -E uh, I am a representative for the Professional Firefighters in Nevada, uh, Reno Airport Firefighters, and also the uh, Reno uh, Fire Department. Um, I, I support this bill and encourage you to please pass it. Um, it's, it's unfortunate when we have members that, that suffer something so devastating that, that they can no longer work anymore. And it would be even more devastating that we would thank them by putting them into a, a detrimental position for the rest of their life, um, simply because they couldn't hold down the job to the level that they used to have. I appreciate your time and I encourage you to pass it. Thank you. We are currently in support testimony on Senate Bill 295. If you'd like to 
provide support testimony, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 971, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. <clears throat> Hey, good afternoon. My name is Corey Whitlock, C-O-R-Y-W-H-I-T-L-O-C-K. I'm uh, calling on behalf of the Professional Firefighters of Nevada, as well as representing the Las Vegas Firefighters Local 1285. Um, I'm, I'm basically echoing the sentiments of my colleagues that called before me. This bill is uh, extremely important um, to all firefighters across the state. And, uh, of course, I call and support a We are currently on support testimony on Senate Bill 295. If you have joined the call and would like to testify in support, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no additional callers in support at this time. Thank you. Do we have anyone in opposition to Senate Bill 295? Uh, Thank nobody... you, Chair, to testify. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, please look on the phones. Thank you, Chair. To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 295, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Hello, this is Kent Irvin, K E N T E R V I N from the Nevada Faculty Alliance. I was actually in the queue to speak in support, if that's okay. Please go ahead. Uh, so, Kent Irvin for the Nevada Faculty Alliance. Uh, we support this bill and the principle of long-term disability insurance and a, a benefit that covers the uh, income for fire firefighters as well as all state employees who can no longer work because of a permanent disability. And so we support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have any callers on the line in opposition to Senate Bill 295? Thank you, Chair. Caller with the last three digits, 750. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Commissioner and ladies and gentlemen of the Senate Finance Committee. This is Sean Meng. That's S-H-A-U-N-M-E-N-G on behalf of the Nevada Self-Insured Association. Um, I've heard the comments from uh, all those who are uh, are present here today, Mr. Mills and uh, and uh, Senator Canazaro, um, and I, I respectfully disagree with um, with some of their analysis as to the purpose of the Industrial Insurance Act and certainly permanent total disability benefits under that act. Um, these permanent total disability benefits are obtained uh, by either electing, uh, like under the Heart and Lung Bill that we're talking about today. Um, and representing that you're permanently and totally disabled um, or having a physician um, report which indicates that you're permanently and totally disabled. This is different than a permanent partial disability. Um, in a permanent partial disability situation where that you have restrictions, you may be unable to perform your job. However, in a permanent total disability situation, an injured worker is, or, or a, a worker with an occupational disease is unable to perform any job. That's what's being indicated by the report from the physician. And that's what's being indicated when they elect to receive those benefits under the heart and lung bill. Here, it's counterintuitive and outside of any reasonable reading of the statutes in the Industrial Insurance Act to suggest that somebody who's permanently totally disabled and receiving benefits to supplement or to, um, or to, to replace their salaries and wages um, to be able to go out and double up and get another job. We agree with the Department of Administration, and, um, and, and we believe that, that the other municipalities in the state didn't have a, 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 a sufficient basis to really be able to analyze what the true extent of this impact will be. Um, there, the extent of the impact will be twofold. One, you'll have individuals who are currently w working and not receiving permanent total disability uh, benefits who will go out and, and request to obtain those permanent total disability benefits since they can now specifically um, uh, obtain both a new 
employ- new employment wages and permanent total disability benefits. Um, and, and two, um, you'll have, you'll have a, a greater impact on the current permanent total disability cases where that some of those, um, a substantial amount in Southern Nevada, um, have been prevented from receiving permanent total disability wage replacement benefits, but currently obtained through the statutes that have already been indicated, uh, medical benefits while they have a new job. Um, can can we, you kind of come to a conclusion? This, can you come? Excuse me. Can you please come to a conclusion Absolutely. with your uh, your your statement so that we can get more uh, callers in? Absolutely. And uh, just just to sum up, um, we agree with the Department of Administration's uh, fiscal analysis. We would ask that you would um, do further investigation. Allow the other municipalities to to perform investigation and analysis. Um, on their own um, to amend their their own um, fiscal notes on this, and um, we we would ask that um, that the bill not pass um, as is, um, since there is a substantial fiscal impact on those entities of the state of Nevada. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have anyone else on the line and uh, opposition to Senate Bill 295? Thank you, Chair. Caller with the last three digits, 735. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, Justin Harrison, J-U-S-T-I-N-H-A-R-R-I-S-O-N, representing Clark County. Uh, We are here today opposed to the bill, but I would first like to thank Majority Leader Canizaro for taking the time to meet with us regarding our concerns uh, following the hearing in Senate Commerce and Labor. Uh, currently, the fiscal impact on Clark County is unknown, as there's no way to determine how many future PTD claims may arise. Um, however, currently, Clark County is obligated to pay nearly um, $200,000 a month in PTD payments. Uh, which is roughly $2.4 million a year. Um, I do want to echo the comments of NSIA, the self-insurers, as well as the Department of Administration. And thank you again for hearing my testimony today. Thank you. Could you see if we have any other callers in opposition to 295? Thank you so much, Chair. We are currently in opposition testimony on Senate Bill 295. If you have joined the call and would like to Testify in opposition. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no additional callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Do we have anyone in the neutral position on the phones to Senate Bill 295? Thank you, Chair. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 295, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. So we can um, close the hearing on Senate Bill 295, and we'll open the hearing on Senate Bill 297. And Senator Spearman, I blew it. Um, I should have taken your bills together, and I'm sorry about that. Let me just sit here and wait. Um, And uh, I just wasn't thinking, so I really apologize. And Senate Bill 297 uh, was introduced by Senator Spearman and uh, heard in uh, Committee on Government Affairs. And it revises provisions relating to agriculture. And um, if we, we've got a uh, fiscal note from uh, the Department of the Division of State Lands. And uh, Mr. Thorley, I don't know if you could explain that to us. And then after that, Senator Spearman, if you just want to really briefly describe what the bill does and and why it would have generated a fiscal note. And then I think you've proposed an amendment that will solve that problem. All right, Mr. Thorley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wayne Thorley for the record, LCB Fiscal Analysis Division. Um, As you noted, Mr. Chair, there there is a fiscal note from the uh, Division of State Lands of the State Department of Conservation and Natural Resources that is available on Nellis uh, attached to the bill. The, uh, the fiscal note specifically uh, applies to um, 
provisions in the bill uh, that um, uh, relate to um, the the ability of the, the state lands division to lease uh, state uh, lands um, uh, based upon the fair market value um, and charge a fee for that. Uh, the um, the division has indicated that this the provisions of the bill will, will negatively impact their ability uh, to will collect those fees. Essentially, they estimate a reduction in fee re uh, lease fee revenue of approximately $38,000 in each fiscal year of the biennium. And they also indicate uh, that um, there would uh, be personnel and operating costs uh, associated with the bill. Those are estimated at uh, $35,000 in each year of the biennium. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thorley. Uh, go right ahead, Senator Spearman. Thank you, uh, Senator Pat Spearman, representing Senate District 1. Uh, real simple amendment. We took them out of the bill and uh, have decided to go with um, private uh, landowners or how we can do it. So the um, Bureau of Land Management is no longer in the bill, so that eliminates the fiscal note. I'm sorry. And what the, what the bill does, I'm sorry, what the bill does is um, I think those of you who have been here for three or four sessions know that um, our former colleague, um, Senator Joyce Woodhouse, every year has bought something that has to do with uh, food security. And last session, she had the bill that, w that created the uh, Food Security um, Council. And we also had uh, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> now com Commissioner, um, just lost his name, McCurdy. McCurdy, McCurdy yeah, Commissioner McCurdy. Um, he also had a couple of bills, one in two 2017 and one in 2019 uh, that dealt with food. Basically what you have, and there is a direct correlation between food deserts and the comorbidities that exist in BIPOC communities that make, make us more susceptible, made us more susceptible to COVID. Uh, this is an opportunity for those communities to, have, to, to create community gardens and to create opportunities for employment through urban farms. And it would be the same thing as community gardens, but it would be larger and the um, produce that's grown there would actually be sold in the store. Uh, this, I believe, will, will be an answer to um, years and years of saying, we need grocery stores, we need, we need stores where we can afford to get the food. Because the food in, <clears throat> in many of those neighborhoods, the food that they can afford is not good for them. And the food that would be good, they simply can't afford. I uh, just want to give a, a real quick um, antidote here. I was driving in my, uh, in my district uh, up uh, Aliante Parkway and saw someone coming out of Smith's and um, they, had, they had two bags and they had some kids with them that had a bag and one of the bags was sitting on a skateboard and that's how they were getting, getting home to wherever it was that they were going. So what this will really do is it provides an opportunity for people to eat well so they can get well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Do we have uh, any questions for the Senator? Uh, thank you, Senator Spearman. So um, if you want to um, uh, discuss your amendment and what the amendment does, and, uh, and, and then we go from there. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Pat Spearman, <laughs> representing Senate District 1, the proposed conceptual amendment would delete Section 8.5 of SB 297. Section 8. Point five authorizes under certain circumstances the lease of state lands for use as a community garden or urban farms at less than fair market value. And so that provi per, uh, provision has now been eliminated. All right, thank you. Um, so any questions for Senator Spearman? And do we, um, do we have anyone from state lands on, on the Zoom? does not appear as if we do. I'm trying to confirm right now if I had any any uh, feedback from the state lands. Yeah, we've, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, Pat Spearman, representing Senate District 1. We've, um, I contacted uh, Division Head about three weeks ago and he said he was going to send a, um, 
just a statement that it took them out, once we took them out, that there would be no amendment. Um, we called again yesterday and today. So I imagine they may be as busy as we are. Yeah, I, I'm trying to th see if I have any confirmation, but think, I mean, it's, it's, it seems as if it's pretty obvious that the, the one piece that created that in their definition in their fiscal note, or excuse me, in their description of their fiscal note, it refers directly to that part of the bill. And this amendment takes that whole entire part of the bill completely out of the bill. So it's, it's uh, we, always nice to get some confirmation, but, um, but I think that that's, uh, that's stuff what we needed to see and what we needed to hear, so I appreciate that. Um, do we uh, and, and be sure that you, you follow up even after this so that when it gets over there? Um, so um, do we have any questions at all? All right. Uh, seeing none, thank you, Senator Spearman. And, and, and you might just want to hold tight because we're going to go right in your next bill. Uh, do we have anybody um, on the phones for Senate, uh, in support of Senate Bill 297? Thank you, Chair. To testify in support on Senate Bill 297, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Color with the last three digits, 956, please press star 6 to unmute. Thank you, caller. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chairman Brooks um, and committee members. This is Charlie Donahue, Donahue, D-O-N-O-H-U-E. I serve as the administrator for the Division of State Lands as well as the State Land Registrar. I have been in communication with the bill sponsor. I know I'm out of uh, uh, position. I should be in neutral, frankly, but uh, this is where broadcast services directed me. But um, the Division of State Lands has no problem removing our fiscal note once, once action is taken on the uh, Senator's proposed conceptual amendment of removing Section 8.5 in reprint for SB 297. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the committee on that? I think that that was, uh, uh, um, thank you for confirming that. And uh, so with that, we can go to anyone who's uh, on the phones in support of Senate Bill 297. Thank you, Chair. As a reminder, we are currently on support testimony on Senate Bill 297. If you would like to provide testimony in support, Please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 580, please press star six to unmute. Thank you, caller. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jolene Cook, J-O-L-E-N-E-C-O-O-K, and I'm on, and on behalf of Reno Food System. I'm calling to testify in support of SB 297 because I am a board officer with Reno Food Systems, and I have seen what an amazing impact a small group of committed people can make on an underutilized plot of land. We lease five acres from Washoe County, and uh, like I said, it wasn't being used at all. And now we've been having uh, a farm stand and we've put into protection almost five acres. And we have a weekly farm stand. We have eight people committed on the board to the mission. And it's just a real beautiful operation and a real um, testament to um, how much a small committed group of people can do. Um, and we're very committed to food justice and food insecurity. We have a mobile farmer's market that goes out into food apartheid um, once a week in harvest season. And thanks to the CARES grant, we had over $100,000. So we were able to buy produce from farmer's markets um, that what didn't get sold and send it directly to food pantries. Um, so I just see the real um, uh, capacity and synergy of local nonprofits and local organizations like ourselves to work um, with a, like a federal, you know, national uh, codified kind of state level support, if you will. And to have that synergy, I can just see us being able to expand um, our mission and get more support. Uh, I think I've said what I wanted to say. I was a little nervous, but thank you for hearing me and thanks for your time. Thank you. Um, do we have anyone else on the phones for uh, 
in support of Senate Bill 297. Thank you, Chair. Again, we are in support testimony on Senate Bill 297. If you have joined the call and would like to testify in support, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no additional callers in support at this time. Thank you. Do we have anyone here in opposition to Senate Bill 297? I do not see anyone. So do we have anyone on the phones in opposition to 297? Thank you, Chair. To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 297, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. All right, thank you. Do we have anyone in neutral on Senate Bill 297? Thank you, Chair. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 297, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Thank you. So we can close the hearing on Senate Bill 297 and we'll open the hearing on Senate, 3, Senate Bill 341. Senate Bill 341, also um, sponsored by Senator Spearman, uh, was out of the, referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services and it revises provisions relating to health care. And uh, Mr. Thorley, if you uh, had any um, description of the fiscal issues with that bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wayne Thorley for the record, LCB Fiscal Analysis Division. Um, if you look on Nellis, there's a handful of fiscal notes attached to the bill. Um, real briefly, the Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy submitted a fiscal note on the bill as introduced, indicating that the fiscal impact could not be determined. Uh, subsequent to an amendment being adopted, uh, the, on, the re, on the first reprint version of the bill, the Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy submitted an unsolicited fiscal note indicating uh, no fiscal impact, so no longer undetermined. Uh, the Division of Public and Behavioral Health also submitted an unsolicited fiscal note on the first reprint indicating uh, a fiscal impact. However, uh, yesterday we did receive uh, an email from uh, the Division of Public and Behavioral Health indicating that uh, with a, an amendment that is being proposed uh, that uh, their uh, fiscal note would uh, go to zero. And that uh, I believe is uh, per available as an attachment. The, the email from DPBH is available on Nellis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Thorley and uh, Senator Spearman. If you just want to real brief, this one seems cut and dry at this point now that you've proposed this amendment. If you want to real briefly tell us what the bill does and then and then to speak to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Pat Spearman representing Senate District 1. Uh, what it does is it implements some very critical areas of um, support for health care and BIPOC communities again. And for me, um, one of the best things that it does is it helps us to further memorialize, if you will, um, the work that our former colleague Tyrone Thompson did um, with reestablishing the uh, Office of Minority Health and Equity. So it's a good bill. And uh, I want to thank Senator um, Bradley for helping to walk us through the maze and Julia Peak um, and everybody over at DHHS so we could get this bill done. Thank you. Thank you. And so I'm on Nellis on, on our site today uh, for, for this meeting, the site for this meeting. And it's a proposed conceptual amendment for SB 341 first reprint prepared for Senator Spearman. Is that the amendment that we're referring to? Yes, sir. Right, right on. Well, there we go. And so uh, that amendment removed the fiscal notes. So um, and we have documentation from the agency that um, that that said that this amendment removes the fiscal note. So, any any questions for um, Senator Spearman from the committee? And I think we can get um, uh, Julia Peak on the phone if we need or if if the committee has any questions. Does the committee have any questions? We we do have some written um, confirmation. So. All right, I don't think we do. Thank you, Senator Spearman. And with that, we'll go and see if we have. Uh, anyone in support to Senate Bill 341 in the room? 
Uh, we do not. Do we have anyone on the phones in support of Senate Bill 341? Thank you so much, Chair. To testify in support on Senate Bill 341, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 519, please press star six to unmute. Thank you, caller. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Thank you. My name is Kelly Goss. It's K-E-L-L-Y. My last name is spelled G as in George, O-S-S as in Sam Sam. I'm with Dialysis Patient Citizens and we are a national nonprofit patient-led advocacy and education organization. Um, and I do uh, our advocacy in our Western state. Um, thank you, Chairman um, and committee members for uh, letting me testify in support of uh, SB 341, um, which would create a kidney disease prevention and education task force uh, with the purpose to raise awareness, educate, and conduct outreach, particularly aimed at populations who are most at risk of developing chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. Uh, this would be a fantastic opportunity to create a public-private uh, partnership involvement with, with stakeholders uh, to, to uh, address kidney disease, which uh, has definitely dis disproportionately affects the minority populations um, in a more holistic way instead of sort of attacking it in silos as we currently do with the goal to reduce health disparities, improve patient outcomes, and lower health care costs. So we hope that you will be supportive of uh, the bill and continue for its passage. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak on behalf of support of SB 341. Thank you. Do we have anyone else on the phone in support of Senate Bill 341? Thank you, Chair. We do. Caller with the last three digits, 528. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Uh, yes. Chairman Brooks, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Barry Gold, B A R R Y G O L D. I'm the Director of Government Relations for AARP. AARP is strongly in support of SB 341, as this bill will actually save money in the future by reducing health costs, by making sure people get the appropriate health care that they need and deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else in support of Senate Bill 341? Thank you, Chair. We are currently on support testimony on Senate Bill 341. If you would like to testify in support, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no additional callers in support at this time. Thank you. Do we have anyone in opposition to Senate Bill 341? Thank you, Chair. To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 341, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. Do we have anyone in the neutral position on Senate Bill 341? Thank you, Chair. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 341, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, caller with the last three digits, 913. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Brooks and members of the Senate Finance Committee. This is Julia Peek, J-U-L-I-A-P-E-E-K. And as was noted, um, we would very much like to thank Senator Spearman and Senator Reddy today for um, doing several amendments uh, that we think will help the bill. And we are completely removing the fiscal note, and that's been provided in Nellis. As soon as that second reprint hits, we will ensure that we get an unsolicited fiscal note in there so the record online is correct. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Peek. Uh, yes. Oh, so sorry. I apologize for the interruption. I was just going to say there are no additional callers in neutral at this time. Perfect. Thank you. Um, with that, we can close the, the hearing. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Senator Kikheffer. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was able just to finally find um, the proposed conceptual amendment. So it looks like you're amending a lot of a different bill into this bill. Um, Senate Bill 302. Is it, am, I, am I reading that correctly? Uh, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> yes, Senator Batch, Chairman, Representative Senator just one uh, through you to uh, Senator Key Cover. Yes, we took some uh, items, areas out of 302, and yes, we did put them in 30, uh, 341, but it did not uh, it did not create an additional fiscal note. So what what was taken off uh, will still stand. Okay. All right. I I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments before I close this hearing on Senate Bill 341? All right, thank you. Um, and so we have one more bill, but uh, Sen Senator Spearman, like, stay there for a second if you would. We have one more bill, Senate Bill 420. Um, are we, is it okay with staff? I mean, I do feel that we, you have the uh, appropriate information. Um, I would be interested in and work sessioning Senate Bill 297 and 341 um, so that Senator Spearman um, can go about her day uh, since she's been sitting here patiently with us for hours now. I meant to pass them all. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we had uh, in Senate Bill 297, we had an amendment proposed and posted, and, and it removed the fiscal note, and we got confirmation from the agency. And then on 341, we had an amendment uh, proposed and posted. And we got confirmation from the agency that that would uh, remove their fiscal notes. So, so I uh, will start with Senate Bill 297. Um, I would uh, propose uh, we open a work session on Senate Bill 297. Um, does anyone have any questions on 297? Okay, so I would um, uh, entertain a motion to amend and do pass based on the amendment was, that was proposed by Senator Spearman and posted on Nellis. Uh, I have a motion from Senator Ratty, a second from Senator Dennis. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, nay. And the motion carries unanimously. And, sen and that's uh, uh, Senate Bill 297, uh, that an amend and do pass. And uh, Senator Spearman will have that floor statement. Thank you. And then that uh, takes us to uh, a work session item uh, three, Senate Bill 341, uh, again from Senator Spearman. Um, uh, we had a amendment proposed by Senator Spearman posted on Nellis, and that amendment uh, we confirmed with the agency that that removed their um, fiscal note. So any discussion or, or questions on Senate Bill 341? Seeing none, uh, take a motion to amend and do pass. Amend and do pass with the amendment that was presented today. Uh, I have a motion from S Senator Ratty, a second from Senator Dennis. Do I have any discussion on the motion, Senator Kikafer? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That amendment has just a ton of public policy in it that I haven't had a chance to look at or um, think about, so I'm going to vote no. Thank you, Senator. Um, do we have any other discussion? Senator Severs Gansert? I'm going to vote yes, but reserve my right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, any other discussion? I'm going to vote no, but reserve my right. Senator Hammond, thank you. Okay. Well, in that case, we can. We have a motion, we have a second, and we have discussion on the motion. Uh, any further discussion? All right. Seeing none, all in favor, aye. All opposed, nay. And so I have a, a no from uh, Senator Kikeffer and from Senator Hammond. And the motion passes. And um, that floor statement will be uh, assigned to you, Senator Spearman. And I think that's it for you today. And thank, thank you, you for Chair. being patient and sitting here with us for hours. I knew I was meeting with the money committee, so I wore green. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. 
so that brings us to um, uh, Senate Bill 420. And we have uh, Senator Canazaro back again and to present Senate Bill 420. And Senate Bill 420, um, uh, sponsored by Senator Canazaro and, and friends, um, and came out of the Health and Human Services Committee. And it revises provisions relating to health insurance and uh, Mr. Thorley, if uh, you ha could describe some of the fiscal impacts for us, and then Senator Canizaro, if you could tell us a little bit about the bill and what it does with a emphasis on w why it has a fiscal impact. And uh, Senator, um, excuse me, Mr. Thorley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Wayne Thorley for the record. Uh, LCB Fiscal Analysis Division. Um, we reached out to several agencies uh, requesting a fiscal note pursuant to statute. Um, the responses are available on Nellis, uh, attached to Senate Bill 420. Um, the Division of Healthcare and Fi Healthcare Financing and Policy has a fiscal note um, attached. Uh, uh, indicating the the total computable impact of the bill um, f is uh, 75.5 million over the biennium, um, and then on ongoing uh, 103 103.7 million over the biennium. However, the state general fund portion of that would be uh, 26.2 million in the upcoming biennium, the 21-23 biennium and then uh, 39.8 million uh, going forward in future biennia. Um, that's for, um, that, that's the overall cost. There are details, uh, the Division of Healthcare Financing and Policy has uh, uh, quite a few details about the assumptions and, and uh, what went into development of their numbers, uh, staffing needs and things like that. Um, that they would do a better job explaining than I would, so I'll leave it to them to do that. Um, the uh, Silver State Healthcare Exchange also uh, submitted a, uh, a fiscal impact. Um, the majority of the impact would be on future biennia. Uh, the Silver State Health Insurance Exchange indicates that uh, for, the, for the upcoming 21-23 biennium, uh, the fiscal impact would be uh, about uh, $500,000. Uh, related to carrier onboarding and uh, waiver development, but the, uh, the majority uh, they've indicated would be in future biennia. Uh, they estimate uh, $9.9 .9 million uh, in future biennia. And then the remaining uh, fiscal note is from the Division of Welfare and Supportive Services, uh, where they're estimating a fiscal impact of $1.3 million in FY22 only. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And uh, Senator Kinazaro, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Nicole Kinazaro. I represent Senate District 6 in the northwest portion of the Las Vegas Valley. Um, and I will keep my explanation of Senate Bill 420 very brief. I unfortunately uh, am not as smart as Senator Spearman, did not wear green, but I am here to present to you what I think is just a very small bill that probably no one's heard anything about. Uh, Senate Bill 420 uh, establishes the Nevada public option and also includes some Medicaid pieces. Um, so I will keep the explanation fairly uh, short for members of the committee because I know we're concerned about the fiscal impacts, um, but certainly happy to answer any questions about the bill. So the bill um, seeks to address the ongoing cost of health care and, and the number of Nevadans who remain persistently uninsured here in the state, despite the fact that we have implemented the ACA and despite the fact that we are one of the Medicaid expansion states, um, we still have a persistently high uninsured rate of around 11 percent um, of uninsured individuals here in Nevada. And the public option seeks to 
uh, establish a plan that would be offered, an insurance plan that would be offered both on and off the exchange that has um, paired with it not only the state's capacity for purchasing power in order to help to drive down the cost of those in, of that of the insurance plans, um, but also has along with it premium reductions and the ability for the state to apply for federal waivers and other dollars in order to in order to uh, in order to help drive down the costs for Nevadans who are looking to purchase. Uh, health insurance and uh, are simply not able to afford it on the exchange at this time and do not qualify for Medicaid. Um, and so that is what we are seeking to do. This is available to both individuals and to small groups. Um, and so that is sort of the very basic overview of the public option. Um, from our perspective, this came from a, as a result of quite a few um, looks into how to help solve for increased health care costs that result in individuals not being able to afford insurance, um, notably the most recent of which was SCR 10 from the last legislative session where we put together an actuarial analysis during the interim to come up with what would look at the feasibility of establishing such a public option. Um, so that is sort of one piece of the bill and that is a very high level brief overview of the public option. The second piece of this bill um, where there are also some fiscal um, implications as well includes a variety of other um, services and, and Medicaid expansion in order to solve and to help with what I think has been um, some really remarkable work done here in the state um, mostly and I will not take credit for this uh, mostly due to the efforts of some of our colleagues over in the assembly um, in particular assemblywoman Danielle Monroe Moreno who's been working on maternal on maternal health for quite some time but in conversations with the Department of Health and Human Services it did come to light that there were a number of things that we could be doing better here in the state to increase access to care for pregnant uh, moms and for their postpartum care as well and so you'll see those pieces um, reflected not only in the fiscal note but also in Senate Bill 420. It includes the um, it includes services for things like lactation consultants. It also includes um, community health workers to help uh, with the number of care providers who can provide this type of care for doula services um, and for increased um, moms who would qualify for prenatal care as well as genetic testing um, and other things. And the whole goal of that policy piece is to provide better care both prenatal and postpartum for moms and babies so that we can have better health outcomes um, because we know that when we can get not only that preventative care and as I am a, a specimen in in the process of exploring exactly what that all entails um, as we can do more of the the prenatal care we know that babies are healthier moms are healthier um, we have a lower risk of deaths for for moms as well and so that is included in the bill two pieces in the bill um, and you'll see those are reflected differently in those fiscal notes as well pieces uh, that will help to stand up the public option and then pieces that relate to the Medicaid changes for those uh, for the prenatal and postpartum care. Mr. Chair, um, we did submit to this committee a mock up. Um, it is proposed amendment 3409 to Senate Bill 420. Um, in that mock up, there were some um, things that have been raised since we had heard this bill in the committee. Um, I mentioned that there was a process included in Senate Bill 420 to apply for federal dollars. Part of that would include some waivers. Um, we heard some concerns from um, providers, hospitals, some of the business industry that there that at actual at actuarial analysis um, should be required. It is required for certain waivers, but we wanted to make that language very expressly clear. So we did um, agree to an amendment in that regard to ensure that there's an actuarial analysis that takes place um, if this bill were to pass before we would go to procurement to ensure that what we are dealing with um, in terms of the legislation and what we're trying to solve for really does fit the problem. Um, and so this will require for that actuarial study to be completed prior to the submission of those waivers um, so that we actually have that data before we go and submit for the waivers. Um, additionally, <clears throat> the mock-up does require that the actuarial study consider the impact on the market premiums and without the participation requirements for healthcare providers as outlined in section 13. 
in the bill as was originally um, put together. You also see that the waiver deadline, um, that the waiver application that was described could not be used to seek a waiver of any eligibility rules for those who would qualify um, under the Affordable Care Act to purchase a qualified health care plan and receive advanced premium tax credits on the exchange. And then we've also been in um, conversations with the Department of Health and Human Services to help look at some of the Medicaid pieces. And we believe that there may be some opportunities um, for some federal funding at some point, but wanted to include the, that language in the bill as well. I um, mean, I think that the Department of Health and Human Services and the, um, either Mr. Young or Ms. Bierman should be available as well to kind of talk through some of those um, pieces. Additionally, uh, I wanted to let the committee know that we'd submitted a little conceptual amendment because I wanted to make sure that the bill also had um, some of the other language that we had intended to include that was not reflected in the mock-up. We want to make sure that the actuarial study does consider the impact on the market premiums so that that is a piece of the information that we are getting. Um, and then there was some clarification language that we needed for the premium reduction, which is a 15%. And we wanted to make sure it was at least 15% lower than the average second lowest market premium. And I think those are just some clarifying pieces of what the bill has been intending to do. Um, but in terms of amending the bill, those were the, the items that I wanted to make sure were presented to the committee today. The only other thing that I will add before noting that we should have um, DHHS with us to help explain some of this as well, their fiscal notes, we've been in conversations with them, their fiscal notes did not reflect some of the changes that were made both in the committee um, and that were that are part of what we've presented to the committee today in terms of the mock-up. Um, I'm sorry, that we're part of the Health and Human Services Committee amendment that was adopted already and that is reflected in the first reprint, um, as well as this mock-up that's presented to the committee. We did change, um, for example, one of, I think, the bigger pieces, we did change in the Health and Human Services Committee the date for when we would go into procurement for the contract and the contract and the, excuse me, the plan year, the first year for that. And I believe that based upon some of those amendments that were adopted by the Health and Human Services Committee and also um, the proposed changes that we've been discussing, that there would be a reduction in the fiscal note. Um, but I know that they were not able to get a full, uh, a full fiscal note revision to this committee. Um, but that we do believe that there would be a reduction in the cost both to stand up the public option and then for some of those Medicaid pieces uh, as well. Thank you, Senator Canazzaro. Uh, do we have any questions for Senator Canazzaro before we get, uh, oh, I think I just saw Free, uh, Director Freed and there you are. And so do we have any um, questions for Senator Canazzaro? All right, well, I'm, uh, oh, we're, oh, oh, Senator Sievers Ganser, sorry. <laughs> Th thanks, Chair Brooks. Um, you know, in reading the, the bill, healthcare is extremely complex. And I know the goal is really to get access to care, get, get care to more people. Um, it's my understanding that we have quite a few people who are eligible for Medicaid and, and not enrolled. And so I don't know if, as, as part of the study, if we're looking at that or, or if there's a way, um, again, to try to help people get access. Um, because the fiscal note is substantial, and when we do get that federal match, that helps. And so the, I, I think the first stop is probably looking at, at Medicaid. And then I'm also, this is uh, sort of broader, I'm concerned about the supply side. So when we, right now we have a hard time having people seen in offices because of our rates. I think the rates kind of drive that and having individuals who see those patients and then ex expanding it even further without having um, funding available could, could drive our supply out. I'm really worried about the supply side, whether it's facilities, whether it's providers. And um, so I don't know if you're going to be able to address that and, and maybe may the study will help with that. I'm not quite sure, but I think we've, we're leaving folks um, who are eligible, not enrolled, and then concern about the supply side and, and really growing that pipeline of providers if we want to expand the, the access. Thank you. Um, and thank you through you, uh, Chair, to Senator Severs Ganser, Nicole Canazaro, Senate District 6. So I will say that with respect to individuals who, as part of that uninsured population, who are eligible for Medicaid but are not enrolled, um, that is correct. There is a, there is a, a chunk of those individuals 
they would not be eligible for the public option because they would, well, they could buy off the exchange for the public option. They, we would want them to be enrolled in Medicaid if that's what they're qualifying for. And likely, individuals who are qualifying for Medicaid, quite frankly, are not likely the population who is also going to go out and pay a premium for, um, for, a, for a health insurance program. Um, I think, generally speaking, when we're talking about how do we start to get more of those individuals who are not enrolled, who are eligible, enrolled, um, part of that is the idea that there is affordable health care out there because a lot of folks think that they just can't afford health care. And if they go and look on the exchange and say, well, I can't afford that, as we build more affordable options and as we're talking more about health care, um, I'm hopeful that that helps us to get more people enrolled in Medicaid who do qualify. Um, I think that that is certainly an issue here in the state that we can have a lot of conversations about. Certainly we've seen some help with that in terms of even just the ACA and like the navigator programs that are going on. Um, but that continues to be something that we want to be able to, I think, build outreach around. And I think this would speak to that. And individuals who would come forward and say, well, you know, I would like to purchase this, but they find out that they're Medicaid eligible, we can go ahead and get them enrolled in, in Medicaid. Um, with respect to the, and I, I guess for clarity purposes, on the provider side, for the public option piece of it, um, what we are going to be looking at with the actuarial, right, is to make sure that what we're putting in place makes sense. Um, from a provider standpoint, currently, and I, I have had a lot of these conversations, from the provider standpoint, individuals who are currently uninsured who end up receiving care in our healthcare system typically are more acute when they present. They typically require much, a much higher level of care because there's not um, preventative health care that is taking place um, in the first instance. And when providers have to see or when hospitals have to see those, those individuals, that is uncompensated care um, that, quite frankly, is a cost to taxpayers that we are absorbing in order to cover those individuals who are not, um, who are not insured. And so by creating an option whereby someone is going to be paying premiums, they're going to be receiving a health care plan, um, and as part of Senate Bill 420, we've included for the procurement pieces incentives for those plans that have um, value-based services. So we're talking about, first I would say that these plans are um, um, fairly qualified health care plans. So they're silver and gold plans. They're plans that are actually going to provide coverage to people for things that they would typically have coverage for, or they would want coverage for. Secondly, in the procurement process, in the bidding process, we're providing incentives for plants that actually are providing things like preventative health care, that are providing the kinds of services and, and medical needs to those individuals. So that those are the kinds of, of plans that we, are, that we are putting forward. In the bill, um, it requires for these plans to be at least a Medicare or higher reimbursement rate for providers, um, which is certainly higher than uncompensated for care. And so I think when we look at the public option and we think about, you know, why would we want to create another place for people to buy health insurance, um, certainly part of that conversation is what happens with the providers. Um, it, frankly, they're either going to be providing uncompensated care to very acute individuals, or we can talk about ways in which um, to get people on health care that they can afford that's going to help with not only preventative care, but also is going to be, I think, better from a provider standpoint in terms of compensation. And if, if, if this is part of the Medicaid pieces for the prenatal and the, and the postpartum care, um, certainly we want to make sure that we're providing more of that care. Um, and we know that there's always ongoing concerns about Medicaid reimbursements for providers. Um, but I think that these are all a lot of services that can help in the long term, especially help um, to mitigate the costs of having babies that are born without proper care prenatal and moms who then also have some more acute issues um, as a result of not receiving proper care, if that answers your question. Thank you for now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, any, any other questions for Senator Canizaro? I, I wanted to go to um, the agencies that created the fiscal notes and try to get a little bit of clarity on that. And, for, and first and foremost, I just want to make sure that the agency that, that um, uh, have all seen the 
conceptual or well the 3409 mock-up that's on Nellis as well as the conceptual amendment that's on Nellis but more importantly the mock-up and um, if if the fiscal notes um, reflect that so I will start with uh, Ms. Uh, Byerman and if, if you wanted to um, address uh, the fiscal note that uh, that you su that you submitted and that was as introduced I believe um, and so if you want to uh, take a look at that fiscal note and and if that you feel that that still stands and um, that if it needed to change based on the reprint and or the uh, mock-up that was provided by Senator Canizzaro afternoon Suzanne Bierman administrator of the division of Healthcare financing and policy for the record thank you for the question um, we do not believe our current fiscal note which was as introduced reflects the changes made in um, amendment 519 or today's conceptual amendment um, we believe that those together will not eliminate but will significantly reduce the division's fiscal note for this bill Specifically, as Senator Canazaro mentioned, um, in the, the First Amendment number 519, the effective implementation date for the public option component of this bill was changed to January 1st, 2026, and we are working to update our fiscal note to reflect um, some changes in terms of staffing costs for the first year of the biennium um, to really reflect that that date has been pushed out by a year. So we do expect um, for some of those um, staffing related costs that the division originally submitted with respect to the public option component to be reduced. Um, you know, I think uh, Senator Canazaro also did a great job talking about the actuarial studies and some of the other contractual costs that the division will incur um, in terms of working together with the Department of um, Insurance and the exchange to implement um, the public option. So we, we don't feel that um, our fiscal note related to the public option will be eliminated, but certainly expect to see some of those first year staffing costs reduced. Um, then um, the second big portion of the bill related to the Medicaid changes, uh, we do believe that today's conceptual amendment will drastically reduce those costs, which is um, where the bulk of the division's costs were in our original fiscal note. Um, specifically, um, the, the provisions that we um, will have remaining in um, the new conceptual amendment will be the expansion for lawfully residing um, individuals, which um, had a fiscal note for the biennium of $110,000 total computable and $40,000 state general fund, and two other provisions, um, one related to community health workers and one related to doulas, and both of those initiatives produce a savings for the division. So um, with the addition of the as funding allows language for, for the rest of the proposed expansions, um, the division sees all of the, the, the additional sections um, specific to the other Medicaid um, expansions being removed. Thank you. Do, do we have any other quest questions from uh, Senator Kiekhefer? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Um, good to see you, Ms. Behrman. Thank you. The, um, so the, the bill would require, as I understand it, um, a spa to change the eligibility requirements um, but it, the the sort of trigger language for as re, as, as resources are available uh, how do you make that determination so for example I'm thinking about the potential extent extension of the public health emergency uh, that could expand our reimburse our FMAP re um, reimbursement into first quarter of 2022 um, how do you balance whether or not to pull the trigger on actually making the application to CMS to change eligibility? Thank you for the, the question, um, Senator Kekeper. Is your question specific to um, all three of the eligibility expansions that were listed in this bill or the one remaining, um, which is related to the lawfully residing? I think it must be for the other two because those are the ones tied to um, the as fund. Um, so I think 
um, you know, we would just monitor budgets closely and come back to this body um, in IFC if we felt that that funding was available um, and seek permission for, from this body at the Interim Finance Committee before submitting any state plan amendments to CMS initiatives that have the as language. You broke up a little bit, Ms. Beerman, but so, so the cost estimates in the fiscal note remain accurate, um, but whether or not they would be um, implemented would, would just be a determination um, that would be made while monitoring caseload and FMAP and, um, and expenses. Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, I, I think the general point is is yes, that's correct. However, I think some of the dates may have changed, which may impact our fiscal note as it exists um, based on that as introduced version um, compared to the, the later two versions. So I think even the eligibility expansions themselves may have um, later dates in some of the amendments. So just wanted to flag that, but otherwise um, your statement's correct. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, Senator Sievers Gansert. Uh, thank you, Chair Brooks, for, for fiscal for Ms. Byerman. So I, I was wondering if we have a number on Medicaid individuals who are eligible or not enrolled. And then um, also looking at the adequacy of the network for Medicaid, if, if we have an adequate network, or, or are, we, are we able to get all of our patients seen or they end up in the ER? And do you keep stats on, do you track that at all? individuals who probably could have been seen by a primary care physician but end up in the ER who are on Medicaid? Thank you for the questions. Your first one, we do have data on Nevada's remaining but uninsured population. Um, we typically use the Gwen Center study, which predates COVID, so always want to make that caveat. But I, I think in that study, they found um, about 155,000 Nevadans back in 2019 were um, likely eligible for Medicaid, but not enrolled. So that is something that is on our radar and um, we're aware of and always um, working with our partners at Welfare and Supportive Services to try to find ways to, to, to reach those individuals. Um, as to your next questions about network adequacy, we do monitor network adequacy. There are requirements in our managed care contracts related to network adequacy for about the 75% of the enrollees that we serve through managed care. And um, for the remainder on the fee-for-service side, we also um, monitor adequacy and in fact just went through um, a pretty comprehensive updating of the state's access monitoring and review plan, which um, includes a lot of the data that you mentioned related to primary care. Um, that activity was actually um, required the update by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in response to the state plan amendments uh, the division submitted um, back at the end of September, early October to address the AB3 reductions. Um, as you all know, um, we're, we're withdrawing the state plan amendments and not seeking to implement, but a lot of the work that we did um, between September and now was really related to uh, looking at access to care for people service population. So we have a lot of data and would be happy to share that report with them. Thank you. Are you able to track um, individuals who end up in the emergency room um, because they're, they're unable to see primary care? Is there a way to track that? I know we know how many emergency room visits we have claims for. Um, I don't know about the tie back to primary care. We could do probably some, some data matching and look at primary care visits and ER, but I don't know that we have a one-to-one -one correspondence, but I'd be happy to take that um, request back to our that we could Thank provide. you. Thank you. I'm just concerned about the supply side and making sure that uh, providers don't don't leave because the, the rates are too low, and I didn't know how we were currently being affected by that. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the committee? Um, no, I, I just wanted to address the uh, the Silver State Health Exchange fiscal note as well, and if if you could um, you know verify that you know that that was based on as introduced, especially around the date changes. If that has anything to do, if that modified the fiscal note in any significant way, and um, and including the mock up that we have on Nellis and the um, conceptual amendment, which uh, to a lesser extent, 
if, if those um, have any effect on or significant effect on the fiscal note in your your opinion. Thank you for the question. Jennifer Krupp, for the record, I'm the Chief Financial Officer here at the Silver State Health Insurance Exchange. Um, the fiscal note that was submitted is based on the bill as introduced. However, um, the mock-up and the proposed amendment will have an effect on the fiscal note. Um, specifically, Section 16.5 is not included in the fiscal note that was submitted, so there will need to be additional analysis that is conducted, um, and our fiscal note will need to be revised based on that. We do expect that it will increase the fiscal note to some degree, but how much we um, can't say with a certainty at this time. Um, six, section 16.5 would require eligibility system changes. It would require additional design development and implementation of um, a secondary eligibility system, as well as additional actuarial study hours. Um, the dates, uh, because some of the dates have been extended, that will have an impact on um, the timelines in which uh, expenses would be incurred by the exchange. Um, and again, that will need to be looked at, but increasing the um, projected start date out to plan year 2026 will uh, certainly make an impact. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the committee? All right, I think. <laughs> I think that that addresses all the the fiscal notes, unless I'm missing any. Um, that, as uh, Mr. Thorley, did, am I? Division of uh, Welfare and Support of Services oh. also submitted an unsolicited fiscal note, I believe. Thank you, thank you. I did miss that one. Uh, did we have anyone from Division of Welfare and Support of Services who could address that unsolicited fiscal note? Thank you. I'll go right ahead, please. Good afternoon, Chair Brooks, members of the committee. Lisa Swearingen, I'm the Chief of Eligibility and Payments here at the Welfare Division. Um, we submitted our fiscal note um, for 1.3 million um, when this bill was introduced. Um, we mapped it or compared it to a similar bill, which is currently over on the assembly side, AB 189, um, asking, AB 189 asks for four of the items that are listed here of the three. So we kind of mapped that to um, so that they aligned. Um, unfortunately, after review on the assembly side for those, we dug in a little deeper and my fiscal note is actually going to increase, not decrease. Um, all three of these components require an update to our system. And it's gonna go from actually 1.3 million to close to 1.7. These changes are available for 9010 funding through um, CMS, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. And so the general fund portion to do all three of these items would be $167,850. Thank you. Uh, and and uh, uh, Mr. Thorley, did you get that that number that, that she? I did not. I missed it. Yeah, I did too. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Just just the number part, not 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 the the whole explanation. Sure. For the record, again, this is Lisa Swearingen with the Welfare Division. Um, so our fiscal note would increase to one million six hundred seventy eight thousand five hundred dollars. Of that, ten percent would be general fund um, at one sixty seven eight fifty. Thank you, I appreciate that. And any questions for Mr. Swearingen? All right, I think we have uh, everything we need. I appreciate that. Um, and Senator Canizaro, did you wanna make any um, other remarks before we wrap up and go to the phones? All right, thank you, thank you, Senator. Uh, do we have anyone here in the room in support of Senate Bill 420? Uh, 
good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Kristen Leonard, K-R-I-S-T-Y-N, L-E-O-N-A-R-D from Silver State Government Relations, and I'm here representing the Nevada Advanced Practice Nurses Association. The association wants to put its support on the record for SB 420 and specifically Section 27, which will authorize, when funds are available, Medicaid fee-for-service to reimburse Nevada's licensed and committed nurse practitioners equal to physicians when providing the same service. The fiscal note created for Section 27 identified $7.8 million in the general fund to leverage $25 million in federal dollars. The return on investment is even greater when you consider benefits to the supply side. Reimbursement parity will retain and attract highly qualified primary care providers to rural and underserved areas. Among the exhibits, committee members will find a document citing more than 40 studies which show that not only do nurse practitioners provide the same quality of care as physicians, their delivery of care, patient satisfaction rates, and ability to educate patients exceed that of other providers. APRNs provide access to health care and specialize in prenatal care and obstetrics. Additionally, their treatment of chronic conditions will prevent acute illness and expensive interventions, reducing lifetime medical costs for individuals. California, Oregon, and Washington all have parity, and in order to retain and attract primary care professionals, Nevada must as well. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else here in the committee room uh, in support of Senate Bill 420? All right, don't see anyone, so let me go to the phones, and can we uh, see if we have anyone on the phone in support of Senate Bill 420? Certainly, thank you, Chair, to testify in support on Senate Bill 420. Please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 338. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Brooks, members of the committee. This is Priscilla Maloney, P-R-I-S-C-I-L-L-A-M-A-L-O-N-E-Y, uh, representing the AFSCME retiree chapter of Local 4041 this afternoon. We testified on the policy side um, for this bill in support of this bill, and we continue to support this bill even though we are now in the financial aspect of it. And we would simply suggest that there is a basic fundamental principle here that marries both access to care and saving money in the long run when policies such as are contained in the public option bill are put into place. Um, we do um, specifically have concerns about our pre-Medicare population, and this sort of circles back to uh, Senator Ganzert's earlier concern about p folks who may be Medicaid eligible. I just want to make one point for the record here that um, it may not be known to all, but one cannot toggle back and forth between Medicaid and Medicare. If a pre, by virtue of their age, Medicare retiree loses their employer-supplied health insurance, they cannot hop onto Medicaid and then when they do age into Medicare eligibility, get back on to, or get on to Medicare. They can't make that transition. And there are some seniors who would prefer to, to protect and preserve their rights to get to the Medicare eligibility status. And for that population who are often um, at the end of their careers, but, but not yet, not yet uh, able to get onto Medicare, they hang on to the jobs that they have uh, or delay health care because they don't want to be forced on to Medicaid. So that is one thing for this committee to to consider that we would be saving some some dollars there um, by assisting those folks to a intermediate option before they age onto Medicare. So thank you for your time. Caller with the last three digits, 837. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Brooks, Majority Leader Canizaro, and committee members. This is Kent Irvin, K-E-N-T-E-R-V-I-N, -E for the Nevada Faculty Alliance, the Independent Association of Faculty at NC Colleges and Universities. 
More than 6,000 faculty at NC institutions rely on the state public employees benefits program for our health care insurance. We are very much in support of the public option in SB 420. The more uninsured Nevadans who gain insurance, the lower the uncompensated costs that are transferred to insured patients. While we support SB 420 as amended, we would prefer that Section 13, subsection 2, be strengthened to fully protect participants in the PEB program from potential future fiscal impacts. Although Section 13 states that PEB may waive the requirement that its providers also join a public option network to, if needed to ensure sufficient access to services, it doesn't explicitly protect PEB participants from possible higher cost or narrower, narrower provider choice if future requests for proposals for provider networks have a requirement for also serving public option patients. That said, while we prefer that stronger requirement, we do support SB 420. Thank you. We are currently in support testimony on Senate Bill 420. If you would like to testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no additional callers in support at this time. Thank you. Could I go to um, uh, folks who are here in the committee room in opposition to Senate Bill 420? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jim Wadhams, W-A-D-H-A-M-S, appearing here today on behalf of the Nevada Hospital Association. As the sponsor and the chair of the policy committee know, the hospital association appeared um, in opposition in the policy committee, and I understand I should keep my attention focused on the fiscal aspect and uh, will do my very best to do so. Uh, I appreciate very much the uh, uh, consideration that the uh, sponsor has given to uh, uh, the issues that the hospital association has previously raised and others. And uh, I think the mock-up and the conceptual amendment move in a positive direction. However, there are still uh, uh, some additional fiscal issues that I think are worthy of at least having consideration. Um, having read SCR 10 again, but then comparing it to um, uh, section two of the bill, I noticed that the key, and it's been evidence in some of the uh, questions already raised, is improving the access to high quality care. Uh, the, the, the actuarial study and then the, the additional reference to the impact on premiums with or without the, without the mandatory participation of providers, I think is the beginning of an analysis, but not the end. I uh, would suggest that the committee ensure that they benchmark the current accessibility. As many of you are well aware, Nevada right now is 45th in the country in terms of physicians per capita, uh, approximately in that same range in terms of nurses per capita. And accessibility is really based upon the personnel available. The hospitals that I represent are physical structures. They don't move a great deal. They're going to be where they are. However, for them to service the patients that will access through the emergency rooms, availability of nurses and doctors becomes critical. So in order to assess the true impact of this and the potential disruption to the healthcare market, I think the accessibility needs to be benchmarked today so that in future sessions of the legislature, you can evaluate whether any of these efforts have actually improved that accessibility or have perhaps caused it to deteriorate. The concern that we have raised is based upon some of the cost models uh, being below the cost of delivering the service. And as hospitals, we have a serious concern that that may deteriorate the cadre, the availability of the physicians to service the patients that do enter. Uh, we appreciate uh, the time and the opportunity to make these statements. And uh, I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wadhams. Do we have anyone else here in the in the uh, committee room in opposition to Senate Bill 420? All right. Uh, let me see if we have anyone on the phones in opposition to Senate Bill 420. Thank you, Chair. To testify in opposition on 
on Senate Bill 420. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 523, please press star six to unmute. Thank you, caller. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Tom Clark. That's T-O-M-C-L-A-R-K. I'm here on behalf of the Nevada Association of Health Plants. I come before you in opposition to the public option provisions in Senate Bill 420 and the financial burden that it could place on the state. In previous testimony, there's been reference to the Minot study that came from ACR 10. It examined the feasibility and design of a public health care plan for Nevada. That study was put forth as an initial analysis of public option plans. It stated in the report, quote, in pursuing a public option model, Nevada policymakers must consider the extent to which the model will have the larger impact on affordability for Nevadans, weighted against the implementation, feasibility, cost of the state, and impacts on existing markets. End of that quote. Before considering 420 and putting in statute an unanalyzed theory, we strongly recommend the state perform the actuarial study and feasibility assessment, along with a full examination of the proposal on insurance market stability, network adequacy in healthcare providers, and potential cost drivers that could unintentionally impact consumers throughout our state. Why is all of that important? Because the numbers in the proposal are arbitrary with no actuarial analysis to support them. For example, why is it a 15% premium target reduction, a target that has already moved from five years to now four years? An analysis has not been completed to understand the impacts on Nevada's patients, providers, and hospitals. What levels of rate cuts to hospitals and providers are actually required to enable health plans to achieve the premium reductions defined in this bill? Is it mathematically possible for health plans to achieve the mandated premium reductions in the legislation and offer actuarial sound rates? No feasibility study has been conducted to demonstrate these types of premium reductions can actually be made and sustained without significant cost and unintended harm to Nevada's coverage and care delivery systems. My clients, the private insurance companies, and MCOs must demonstrate that the insurance products they offer are actuarially sound. Shouldn't the state expect the same from a public option? We certainly think so. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Next caller in opposition, please. I'm sorry, Chair. We are currently in opposition testimony on Senate Bill 4. Chair, there are no additional callers in opposition at this time. All right. Uh, do we have any um, uh, callers in the neutral position? Thank you, Chair. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 420, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 490. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Cyrus Hojati, C-Y-R-U-S-H-O-J-J-A-T-Y. We'd like to thank uh, Senator Canizaro to bringing up this issue of health care. It's very important for our country. Premiums are very, very high. I have a mixed bag view of this bill. Number one, I believe it will offer lots of competition and flexible rates against this lack of competitive efforts of this Wall Street takeover of our healthcare system. It certainly has gone out of control. Prescription drugs prices are really, really high as well. Uh, my concern about this bill is that where has this plan or similar idea has taken place in another state. I need more evidence to make sure that it has worked. And speaking of it has worked, I'm concerned about waste. Will this drain budgets? Will there be a level of abuse or something or another? Will some people uh, use it up too much that maybe 
it may not end up being affordable. Although I doubt that, I'm just still concerned. However, we do know for a fact that single-payer healthcare systems have worked pretty well in Europe because they do provide lower cost per capita than the United States. We also know that the ACA has jacked up, on the other hand, premiums on average for Americans. So we have the track record of these types of policies. I just want to know, has this plan worked in other places? But other than that, I do believe this will shake up the system, and I'm very glad that this has been brought forward. But more importantly, can, I also um, want to know you, why are people... Can you, some, can you wrap up your, your testimony so we can make room for, for more callers? Okay, I may have 10 seconds. But other than that, you know, we still have a very unhealthy lifestyle. I want to thank the legislatures for bringing up this bill. And best of luck to the state. Thank you. Do we have anyone else in neutral position uh, on the phone? Thank you, Chair. The public line is open and working, and we have no additional callers at this time. Thank you, Broadcast Services. I appreciate that. Do we have anyone here in the room in neutral? I don't believe I asked that. All right. Don't see anyone. So we can close the hearing on Senate Bill 420, which is the last bill of the day and uh, of, of this part of the day. And, <laughs> and uh, we, um, I would like to work session two bills that we heard earlier. Um, and uh, it was Senate Bill 276 and Senate Bill 295. And so I would like to start with a work session on Senate Bill 276 uh, that was presented by Senator Dennis uh, about the technology fee um, and there were no amendments and no fiscal note, if I recall correctly. And so do we have uh, any comments on Senate Bill 276? Does not seem like we do, so I would take a motion to do pass. I have a motion from Senator Canizaro, do pass. And uh, do I have a second? I have a second from Senator Dondero Loop. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, nay. And motion passes unanimously. And uh, we'll sign that floor statement to Senator Dennis. And that brings us to Senate Bill 295. Uh, that was presented by Senator Canizaro. Um, and it had a fiscal note from Department of Administration and uh, no amendment, if that is correct. Oh, no, it did. No, no there was no amendment, excuse me. And so um, what, any conversation or discussion or questions on Senate Bill 295? Uh, seeing none. Um, I would take a motion to do pass on Senate Bill 295. So moved. I have a motion from Senator Dennis, a second from Senator Don Darrow Loop. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. Opposed, nay. And that motion passes unanimously. And so, Senator Canazaro, uh, you'll have that floor statement, please. And so, we will um, uh, go to. Uh, public comment, I think, so that we can recess and possibly come back, but I believe that this might be the end of the road today. Um, but I want, uh, broadcast services, can, do we have anyone on the line for public comment? Thank you so much, Chair Brooks. The public line is open and working. However, there are no callers at this time. Okay, thank you. Actually, um, if we could take just a really, like a one minute recess. I need to talk to Senator, Senator Ratty really quick.
All right, and we had no public comment, so we can be in for a recess. And um, and if we have to close up any business later on today, I'll uh, it, we'll we'll come back at the call of the chair.